Today is the second day of the conference and it's also uh, the first day of, uh, or the first uh, day's event of the aquaculture boot camp that we've been hosting. Um, and before I get into marketing topics here, just for those of you that are in the boot camp, I just wanted to kind of rehash a little of what we talked about two weeks ago. Um, and one of them was that if you're in the aquaculture boot camp program, uh, one of the requirements is to do a project. And this flyer was in your, your handouts two weeks ago that gave some of the dates that we'd like some information about it. Um, the first one will be by April 21st, which will be our next time that we actually meet, is to have kind of an outline put together as to what your project's going to be about. Okay, um, and then you can see by the next one after that, blueprints, in other words, we'd like to see that you've progressed and, and the concept you've come up with. Um, by uh, June then, kind of what your budget is, if there is a budget for it. Um, and then actually start doing the project come July through the end of 2018. Um, the last aquaculture boot camp will be in January of 2019, and that's when each of you will get your 15 minutes of fame, where you'll get to stand in front of everybody um, and give us a presentation about the project that you did. Um, I had a couple of people email me saying, well, I don't even know, what do you mean by a project? What should I do? So we put a couple of ideas together here. We're not talking high tech, um, but it's really up to you, the scale of it. It can be as simple as that you put a fish tank together and float some plants on it. And the most important part is, is that you record data in terms of seeding of those plants, harvesting of those, survival of your fish. We just want to know that you're, you're giving some thought to this, that if this develops into a business, um, that you basically would be able to uh, have a starting point. Um, you can see here of different scales and sizes. If you already have an aquaculture or an aquaponics system, then what you can do is you can kind of modify it a little bit. Um, and that can be your actual project. Um, so lots of different ideas. Um, a lot of people asked about this. This is on the web and that is barrelponics is relatively popular. Um, again, I think the concept behind it is that it's cheap <laughs> and you can pick up those blue totes of just about anywhere. Um, but just give some thought to that, the type of project. I was just mentioning to Emma that one of our boot camp members emailed me and said, well, do I have to actually build something or can I put together my business plan, my financial plan, and my marketing plan? And I said, absolutely, that's a project right there if you'd rather do that. Um, so we just want to, beyond you know, the 12 times that we meet, we just want to have you, um, you know, get some hands-on activities going um, in terms of the thoughts. And, and by all means, if you're planning on at the end of the boot camp to continue to develop your business, make your project something that's starting your business, all right, so that it helps you along the way. So hopefully that gives you a little bit better idea in terms of what we mean by our project. Um, we've set the dates just to keep nudging you along. Um, you can certainly get things done quicker if you like. If you get them done slower, well then M and I will come up with a nasty email to send you every day. <laughs> so uh, um, again, some thoughts, and if you want to bounce ideas off of any of us, you can email Emma, Greg, or myself and say, well, this is what I was thinking. Is this along those lines? We'd be happy to. We're a partner in this whole 12-month program. Um, so by all means, bounce ideas off of us. Okay, so hopefully that gives you a little bit better idea what we meant by that project. And again, this is for the boot camp members. Um, the other one, which wasn't working when I gave the presentation two weeks ago, uh, but we heard about it yesterday, um, is that uh, NADF, together we put together uh, a siting tool in Wisconsin in terms of uh, locations that uh, have attributes that are uh, more associated with successful fish farms in the state. And by successful, we mean that they've lasted more than five years. Um, and last time when we were doing this, the, this tool wouldn't work, and I found out it was due to the campus's uh, internet security system. So if you go to the NADF website and look under projects, you'll see the GIS siting tool is one of the projects. Um, there's two of them. There's one for pond culture and there's one for uh, flow through or raceway culture. There's also a link to instructions on how you actually operate this. Um, this one here is the pond one. I just clicked on it just moments ago and, and launches. Um, and at the top there you can kind of see a, a little line. Right over here so kind of inside the room you're on, right over there, is the layers tool, which pops open that window on the right. Um, we looked at a variety of factors that we could find data sets about in terms of uh, water pH, nitrate concentration, uh, CO2, things like that, water hardness. Um, if you go down this list, there's also other features on there, such as what is the slope of the land, um, what is the average well depth in those areas. Again, there's statewide data sets available for those that we put into this model. Um, you click on the ones that you find to be important, and then it changes the colors on the map. 
And just for quick reference, anything that's red on there is less favorable for a pond culture system. Anything that's more in the yellows and the greens is more favorable. Um, interestingly enough, and if you're a little bit into Wisconsin history, is that if you actually looked at that map, there was basically a giant glacier that settled right over there, and this is the moraine that was left behind. So it's essentially saying the moraine areas are the better areas to actually put ponds in the state. Um, again, when we put this together, hopefully it'll be a resource for people. You know, if you own property smack dab in the middle of that red, it doesn't mean you can't farm fish there. All right? It just means that you probably have to get a bigger backhoe um, and dig a deeper well. <laughs> Okay, so it's a tool to help you, but it's by no means saying you're going to fail if you go in the red and succeed if you're in the green. It's just giving an idea that the attributes in the green and the yellow are attributes we found at long-lasting fish farms in the state of Wisconsin. Okay, and again, just to quickly show you on here is that you can go over to any one of these tabs that are over here, and if something was really important to you, you know, you, you click on those different features, and you'll notice that the colors then start to change uh, on the overall map. Um, so again, um, it, the link is available through NADF's website um, for pond and flow through. You know, go ahead, go there, use the tool, play around with it a little bit. Um, it, there is an instruction sheet as well, but if something doesn't make sense, again, please get a hold of us and we'd be happy to walk you through it. But we thought this was a pretty good tool to put together and we were kind of a little bit proud of it because we're the first state in the United States that has a siting tool done. Okay, so today's topic and our, and our aquaculture boot camp topic, which I think translates to, to all the fish farmers, is the concept of uh, marketing. And we've got a whole bunch of speakers lined up for you today that are going to be talking about these concepts from different perspectives um, of what marketing is and labeling is of your products. Um, we always, whenever uh, Greg, Emma, or I go around to a fish farm and, and try to offer help, you know, the usual statement we have is, is we can teach any of you how to raise a fish, but we can't teach any of you how to sell it. Right? We're biologists. Um, so today's topic is about marketing. Um, and one of the things, I just have a brief introduction and then Jonathan will come up here with some more details on betting because this is more his field than mine. Um, but basically, when you look at marketing, um, basically what you have to do is you have to look at it from a different perspective. Right? Most of the time you get wrapped up in the fact that you're producing the fish and now you want to sell them. So you're viewing it as a producer. Uh, marketing is really a reverse direction. And that is, is you have to think about it the way that a consumer looks at it. Um, so this nice little diagram shows you here that basically what we have here is the selling concept. So as a producer, you know, what do you do? Well, you have your farm and you produce products that are on your farm. In other words, you raise fish. All right? Then you get to the point you say, well, I want to sell my fish, so how do I sell that? How do I promote my fish um, to others that are out there that might want to buy them? And then essentially, if you can sell them, that's how you register your success, is you've made money off of those fish that you've sold. Through a marketing view, essentially, what I have down here, the marketing concept, you have to view it as the consumer, the, purchase, making, the person making the purchase. And what you have to know is, is well, what are the customers', customers needs? Right? Why are they looking to buy that product? Why are they looking to buy your fish? That's a tough question to answer um, when it comes to something that you're growing yourself because you have a lot of pride in it. Um, what you have to do is you have to in integrate marketing into it. In other words, take what the consumers want and what they're looking for and make sure that your product matches that so that they'll buy it. So success is through satisfaction of the consumer. In other words, did they get the product that they want? All right, and are they happy about the quality of that product? So you have to view it. Again, you, know, you yourself, you're both a, a producer and a consumer. So you consume, though, other products, not the ones you're growing. So you've got to start looking at your fish in the same manner in terms of you know, what does that consumer actually want. All right? How do you do that? Well, you have to do some research. And again, everybody should do this. And again, usually when we do talk to, to people and say, we can teach you how to raise fish, we actually say to them, first get your marketing in order, then call us back and we'll tell you how to raise the fish. Right? Don't raise your fish first and then say, okay, I've got them, now what do I do with them? So when you're putting your market together, what you have to do is you have to look at food trends. Right? What are consumers buying that are out there? What about uh, local demand? Right? This is a, a, a big topic actually, a lot for aquaculture and aquaponics, because a lot of your market's going to be local. Right? So what is that local demand? What do people want to see in a local product? Um, what are they willing to pay? Right? The first thing I tell people when they say, well, how do I figure that out? I say, go stroll through the supermarket. Right? See what the counter prices are for a lot of these products and then figure out where they came up with that number. There's always going to be overhead on it, but where did they come up with that actual number? And another is develop a customer profile. Right? It's pretty amazing if you walk into a restaurant or a supermarket and you walk up to, the, say, the seafood counter at the supermarket, you know, the person, the manager behind there will be more than willing to talk about the products that they sell. 
Right? And then you'll say to them, well, what, who's buying these products? Are they younger groups or are they older groups? Um, it's amazing how much information they're willing to share because they don't view you as competition, they're going to view you as a supplier. Okay? So you look into those aspects of it. Uh, big thing, and this is how I actually learned marketing, is to remember your P's and Q's. Right? P's stand for product, so that's the fish or the plants that you're growing. Price, right? most likely what you want to do is, is you want to survey the seafood that's out there and find out what's the most and the least costly. Um, place, you know, what is your position in terms of selling your product? Now what this means is, is not necessarily um, is it a restaurant, is it a supermarket, is it a bar and grill? But where is the place in which your product is going to find itself on the shelf in the store? Okay? Is it going to be frozen seafood? Is it going to be fresh? Right? Is it going to be in the seafood case or is it going to be off to the side? So it's as much that as it is the actual physical location where you're going to sell it. A lot of it goes into promotion and one of the things you want to see is that consumers like consistency. So when you're promoting your product, come up with a standard type of sales pitch, a standard type of label and stick with it. Right? Don't constantly modify it thinking, oh, maybe they, they didn't sell because they don't like the fact that my label's green, I'm going to change it to blue. Right? If you chose green, stick with green. They want to be able to spot your product wherever they actually go. And then the last one, the cues, really comes back to quality. Right? If there's anything when people go to buy products and surveys are done, what they say is, is I look for a quality product that I can get at a good price. Okay? So always remember that, that quality kind of rules when it comes to uh, why consumers buy a product. I mentioned customer profiles. This is really important as well. Put together information on who you're actually trying to sell it to. Okay? If you look at this table that's up there, one of the first things you want to look at is demographics. Right? What is the typical consumer who's buying your product? Um, what is their age? What is their income? What is their race, their education level? And where do they live? Okay? If you know these things about the people, then you can start tailoring your marketing plan towards the actual consumer. Uh, you might ask, well, where do they get this information from? You'd be amazed at what's on the internet these days. You know, we talked about good and bad yesterday, but you can really pull up a lot of different demographic information right off of things like the U.S. Census of, uh, uh, that's out there. There's a Census of Agriculture or Product Sales that the USDA puts out. You'd be very surprised at how much of that information is just a few clicks away, um, and if you make sure you go to the reputable websites for it. Um, how about uh, psychographics as well? That is, is, what is the consumer thinking of when they're actually going out there to buy their product? Right? Um, what do they use as their, um, uh, or excuse me, what do they do in terms of how far away their product comes from? Um, there's a big movement across the U.S. about what they call the locavore movement. And that is, is that people are very interested in supporting local businesses and finding out that their food didn't come from very far away. And I actually saw the first article come out this winter in which they said that the concept of local food is actually starting to creep up and may surpass the concept of organic food. And that is that people are actually willing to pay for local food more than they're willing to pay for organic food. So it's very interesting. You know, we talked, heard a lot of people talk about organic certification yesterday. It's something to consider. There's still a huge market out there for selling organic produce. Um, but having your product labeled as locally grown is really starting to you know, grow and start to catching up to uh, organic labels as well. So something really to keep in mind. Um, what else do people look at? They like contributing to the greater good. So if you're a new small business in town, people like to support you, get you started at least. Um, the product reminds them of home um, and creates an experience. Um, so this is one way of looking at it is, is you know, what did mom and dad uh, feed you when you were a kid? People will go back and kind of seek that out. Right? I'm a product of that as well. My daughter's over there and as I always say when people say, what was the first seafood you ever ate? If they're honest, the answer is fish sticks. <laughs> right? <laughs> it's what schools give you in the lunchroom. So she'll come home and say, hey, can you, can you go buy some fish sticks? I like these. And then I'll sit there and I may munch on one of them thinking, I don't know what this is and I'm, yet I'm eating it. And you know, hey, you tell me, what's in a fish stick? <laughs> right? And as I'm eating it, I'm thinking, but on the other hand, I remember elementary school. This is what we ate. So there's that kind of feeling. Can you create that feeling again for them? Um, and then there's always the concept of keeping up with the Joneses. And that is, is if your neighbor said, oh, last night we had this lovely salmon dinner. And you'll say, oh, really? Well, next weekend we're throwing a barbecue of salmon and lobster. So, you know, there you go. It can help boost their sales. 
Um, buying motivation, you can see on the list, you've heard most of these before. Healthy foods, support your local farmers, connect with the community. Um, again, memories as a child and uh, product benefits such as health benefits. Um, communicating with them. Um, we'll hear, hear some presentations by some growers today. And that is, is what do you use to get the word out? Um, I'll show you a graph in a second, and that is, is this one up here, social media. Well, if you don't know about it or know how to use it effectively, there are usually workshops put on at local libraries and, and uh, small business centers. It's tremendous the amount of growth and marketing that's coming through social media. Um, and then keep them coming back. They like great customer service. Um, what about special events? Um, I know a fish farmer in Stevens Point that every year he has the fish bonanza you know, at, in September. Right? I don't know what a fish bonanza is, but a lot of people show up his farm to buy fresh fish on that day. Okay, so drawing them in through a special event that, in this case, he fabricated. <laughs> so, uh, availability of your product, knowledgeable staff, so you can tell people all about it, um, and then educational information. We heard people talk about this yesterday as well, and that is, is why isn't seafood pr uh, consumption in the U.S. growing as it is worldwide? A lot of it has to do to uneducated consumers, right? So you have to become an educator at the same time you're selling your product, right? This is kind of interesting. If you've never been to this website and you have half a day you just absolutely want to waste, I found I wasted a half a day on this website. <laughs> and that is, what is the culinary forecast? So the American uh, Association of Restaurants has a, has a website with databases on it that you can fully search. Um, and it turns out that they track what restaurants are serving across the U.S., what the consumers are buying at those restaurants. Like I said, it's pretty fascinating. Um, they actually had a top 10 list, and they said these are the top 10 items that consumers asked restaurants to have on their menu. And as I went through this list, I'm like, boy, farm-raised fish can really jump on this and, and take advantage of it. Right? New cuts of meat, so instead of serving a fish filet, maybe you serve fish steaks. Right? Just think about a different form of the product that you're putting out there. Um, uh, homemade condiments, that's a little different, but street food inspired dishes. Right? Um, we haven't talked about it yet, but value added seafood's a big topic. If you can suddenly create you know, a seafood package to sell to your consumers that reminds them of picking something up at the local food truck, apparently they really like that concept. Um, other things such as ethnic inspired breakfast items, there you go, sustainable seafood shows up as number five, um, but healthful kids meals, right? What's more healthy for a kid than, you know, than eating a fish stick? You could probably come up with something that you sell, right? They're not all that healthy for them. Um, but they have other things up there such as uncommon herbs, authentic ethnic cuisine, and ethnic spices. Um, you could very easily, as I said, add a value added seafood product, put some extra spices in it at one point. I don't know, is Peter Frisch back in the room yet? Because I always use his as an example. Oh, he's not here. There, now I can definitely tell you. For a while, <laughs> Peter sell, sold this uh, uniquely spiced trout filet. And one time I bugged him enough and I said, what is that unique spice? Or is this like a, the Colonel's secret re recipe here or something? And he said to me, oh, that's really simple. He says, I go to the store and I buy a jumbo bag of Cool Ranch Doritos. I smash it up into a powder and I coat my trout fillets in it. And we call that something like Caribbean trout fillet. And I was like, really? You don't call it Cool Ranch trout fillet or something like that? But he said, yeah, but the difference is that bag of Cool Ranch Doritos cost him a buck fifty and he could treat something like fifty fillets with it, but he actually jacked the price up five times the amount that he would sell the normal fish fillet with in terms of coating it in Cool Ranch Doritos. <laughs> so you, know, you can look at that. I laugh at it. I love telling my class about it. On the other hand, I also ended by saying, what a genius. <laughs> I mean, think about that. All right? Um, so keep that in mind. Don't use Cool Ranch Doritos, he's kind of trademarked that, but you can pick any other type of snack that's a salty snack that's out there. All right. Another big part of it as well is developing a brand. All right. Come up with your logo, um, you know, what colors are used in your logo. Consistency seems to be what consumers look for in a logo. And they want to see the same logo showing up on each one of the products um, that they're looking at. Um, we saw Superior Fresh talk about that, that they're going to be in the quick trips, but they have their little logo on it. And it's going to be the same logo that's going to be sold with their fish. Um, easy to look at and easy to replicate. Um, and then weave your brand into everything. Signs and merchandising, t-shirts, hats, uh, bumper stickers, everything like that. Um, another one that's in the upper right-hand corner here, 
Um, there was a fish farmer, he's retiring now, which is Herbie Radman um, with the Bullfrog Fish Farm. Um, I, another person here, I used to teach the students at the university, and I say that if you ever meet him, shake his hand, he's a genius. All right? Look at his marketing slogan, eat my fish. That's it. It wasn't very creative. And yet, I have seen that bumper sticker on cars across America. I actually had a student of mine go a semester abroad in Australia and sent me back a photo of an Australian car with Eat My Fish bumper sticker on it. <laughs> How it got there, I'll never know. All right? But it's simple. All right? And people remember it, and it certainly is a direct marketing slogan. All right? So that's why I say, don't become too creative and too unique with your mod mo um, logos or, or mottos or things like that. It's as simple as that. Again, picking on Peter a little bit, but he's figured it out. Rushing waters, there's his farm. Right? It shows up on their fish products, their dog treats. It shows up on their street signs, uh, baseball caps, everything. But it's the same logo each and every time. Um, Nelson and Paige, some of you have heard about for aquaponics, they actually sell their product under Montello Fresh. Right? If you look at that, it's really just a waterfall falling over a bunch of lettuce. I'm not quite sure what that means, but on the other hand, it's fresh, because water spilling over a waterfall looks fresh to you. Okay? So spend some time on that as well, but once you come up with your logo, stick with it. Right? Don't modify it too much after that. Again, this is what I was talking about. Where are people going to look for information about seafood products? Now, here's a nice pie chart for you. Uh, and that is, is the more traditional things such as ads are basically fading away in this digital age. Right? What you can see is the social media. 25% of the time, people get off the information they need off of things such as Twitter and Facebook. Right? Keep that in mind. If you're not on it, you've got to join up with the, the modern age that's there. Uh, websites. As a matter of fact, websites are actually starting to fall behind now. People don't want to spend that amount of time searching for a website so much. Right? It's still prominent, but it's slipping a little bit. Um, printed material. Well, you've seen that even in the trade show that's out there. And then the farmstead. Putting a good sign out by the road. People really like picking up on that. And they'll stop, especially in a local area, to pick up some food. Okay. Product po positioning is another buzzword to keep in mind, and that is, is that, you know, what are people looking at when they look at your product compared to a very similar product, okay? What you can see here is quality is number one. People want to make sure they're getting a good value for their dollar, right? What else? Well, the cheapest sometimes does, do win out. Okay, you know, again, just picking on it a little bit, I often refer to this as the marketing strategy of Walmart. Right? They make sure that their products are the lowest that are out there. They even have commercials that tell you that they are. Right? Um, that's the way they kind of undercut some of their competition. Now, the other thing which I just thought of as well, the other is, is that people are using things that fit on their smartphones. And websites don't always show up very well on a smartphone. But as you just pointed out, all that free marketing that you get in social media is made for that small screen. Okay, so people are looking for the best value for their money. They're also looking for convenience. Again, you heard it yesterday from Superior Fresh, they're showing up at Quick Trip. Quick Trips are convenience stores by nature. All right, so make it convenient for the customer. Um, and then this one here, you know, we, we talk a lot about why is worldwide aquaculture growing in the U.S. kind of stagnant. One of the main reasons is, is that still when surveys are done, U.S. consumers' perceptions are that seafood products, farm-raised fish included, are considered luxury items. And why is that? Well, look what we like to eat. We had, what, salmon yesterday for lunch. They'll have trout. These are on the high-end costs of fish that you have to raise. If, why is the world aquaculture uh, consumption growing? Because they're eating things such as uh, tilapia and catfish, things and carp, things that are much easier and cheaper to raise. Right? So that's a little bit of a stigma that you have to somehow overcome here in, in when you're doing your marketing in the United States, is to get people to say, hey, try some other fish, maybe not something so expensive compared to what you've purchased in the past. Okay? And then come up with your marketing plan. Right? Make sure where will you market, um, what story will you tell. People love a good story when it comes to raising their, their, their seafood or uh, where they actually bought it from. Um, how much will you budget towards your marketing plan? And how do you actually measure that your marketing plan is successful? And that's another key thing is once you develop your marketing plan, maybe six months out, maybe a year out, evaluate it. Is it doing what you're hoping it is? Um, if not, it's time to change it quickly and go a different route and try again. 
Right? Don't just establish your marketing plan and then say I'm sticking with it for the five to ten years that are out there. If you're not reaching the consumer, if you're not meeting their demands, then it's not working. And it's got to be retooled at that point. Okay, so that's my little introduction to it. And then we have a lineup of speakers, including Jonathan, who's next. Jonathan Van Senten, and I'm here to talk to you today about three topics. Uh, the first of which will be strategic marketing, uh, sorry, adapting to ever changing markets. The second will be strategic marketing, and the third will be farm financial health. Um, I've got a lot to cover in an hour, so I'm going to try and stay on track and on time. Um, so if anyone wants to uh, give me a, hey, you're running out of time signal, I appreciate that. Um, so I guess the first question, I, I should preface all this by saying I am not here to answer, I'm not here to give you the silver bullet because there is no silver bullet. It's that simple. I'm going to go through these topics and discuss things that I've seen, that Dr. Carol Engel has seen in her experience of over 30 years working with aquaculture farms one-on-one. -on -one. And I'm actually going to ask you a whole bunch of questions. And the reason for that is because that's something for you to think about when you go home to either do your project or look at your own business. And I'd be happy to try and answer any questions you have at the end of this. But unfortunately, there's no silver bullet. There's no one answer to solve all the problems. So I can't share that with you because it doesn't exist. So the first question I have for you is, does the world ever stay the same? Right? And once upon a time, we moved around with a horse and cart. We had a, a rotary phone. And I actually still remember those. Um, and that was what an airplane looked like. And I think we all know the answer that no, the world doesn't stay the same because now we have these electric cars and drones flying around and phones that ask us how they can help us as opposed to having to actually touch them at all. <laughs> and so that translates to aquaculture, right? Can your aquaculture business stay the same and survive? Can we still stock fish from milk cans? So what we're faced with is really is, is changing consumer demands, right? There was once upon a time, there was a time when a catfish was really only eaten along the Mississippi River. That's no longer the case. There was a time when the orange ruffy was called a slime head. That's not the case anymore either. And of course, a time when shrimp was a very high value luxury product only consumed in very small volumes. Again, not the case anymore, now just a commodity. So, you know, we see that these changes happen and businesses need to adapt to respond to those. So where is consumer demand headed? In broad general terms, trends show that consumers want highly differentiated individual flavors and products. You have all these different types of detergent to choose from and for some reason I always pick the wrong one and um, hear about it from my wife later. So. <laughs> But, um, but, but that's kind of the trend that we're seeing, is this high, high differentiation of products. There's also this, as, as Chris mentioned just now, this demand for local food that's growing. People are getting more invested in their food. They want to know the story behind their food. And so that is an, indeed a trend that's happening throughout uh, the industries, not just aquaculture, but, but all of food. So then we come to this word, Millennials, and uh, I am a millennial, um, so I want to disclose that. Um, and no, we're not all the same, but, <laughs> but um, there are some things that are true about us in general terms. You know, millennials are, we, we live in the age of information, we're used to instant access to information, that's just what we expect. And so things that we are interested in are, for example, taste. Taste is a huge thing, right? Millennials tend to be foodies. Not everyone, but many of them. Safety, we care about the environment, we care about the safety of the food that we consume. Sustainability, responsibility, these are concepts that, that are not foreign to us. They're actually things we look for in the products. So, so that's just something to kind of keep in mind. You know, when you look at, in terms of this new generation that's entering the market and getting all this buying power, these are kinds of the things that they're looking for in the products they buy. So what does the current business climate for aquaculture look like? The first point I want to make is 
we have competition with imported fish. I think everybody knows that in excess of 90% of the seafood that we consume is imported. That's just a fact. So that's a reality that you face when developing your business, is that you're going to compete in some way with imported fish. It may be uh, a complementary product, it may be a competitor of a product to your product, but you're going to have to deal with imports in some way. The other thing that we know, and as I talked about yesterday, is regulations. There's no way around it. There's regulations. You have to deal with them. They are going to add cost to your business in some fashion. And then we also know that economic growth has an impact on your sales. For example, in the last economic downturn, the consumption of seafood dropped because, again, seafood is viewed as a luxury product. A lot of seafood is actually consumed outside of the home in restaurants. When times are bad, people don't go to restaurants as often. And so we saw in the last economic downturn, as other downturns before that, that the consumption of seafood dropped. And so those are all things that you need to try and factor for in either your business that exists or your plans that you're making for the future. So a little bit about external threats and opportunities. And I think it's really important to stress here that so much of this is going to be site specific. You know, when you're looking at designing your facility, building your facility, the engineering, that's also site specific. What kind of water do you have? What climate are you in? What does the regulation look like for where you are in terms of permitting? But it applies to, to your marketing as well, right? This is specific to your location. So you're looking at, for example, here, what kind of access do you have to water? What does your labor look like? Predation, urban encroachment, are these things that you need to take into account with your business? Do you need to be worried that the community is growing around your farm and may at some point say, hey, I want to buy your farm and turn this into a parking lot? You know, so those are things to consider. And so some of the common pitfalls we've seen for aquaculture businesses are not adapting to changing consumer demands and preferences. You know, if, if people are looking for a highly differentiated product, and you're offering the same product over and over again, that's nothing wrong with that, but they are likely to try something new somewhere else, whereas maybe if you were to offer a slightly, slightly variation Doritos trout, for example, um, you know, that, that, that might entice them to try that and to stay with you. Another pitfall that we've seen is confusing a hobby with a business. Many people get into aquaculture because they love fish. They love growing fish, they love working with fish. And I mean, I, I have a bachelor's degree in biology, marine biology. I got into that because I love being on the water. But if this is a business, you can't confuse it with a hobby. You, you're in this to make money. And so it's not just about growing fish, it's also about selling those fish at a profit. Many people don't account for market risks, for example, competition that I mentioned earlier, or an economic downturn that could have an effect on their business or their bottom line. And I mentioned this briefly yesterday, for those of you that were here, and I'll talk a little bit more specifically about it um, in the uh, later presentation that I'm giving today. But um, adequate capital investment and cash flow really are two of the, uh, the biggest pitfalls for aquaculture businesses that we see. And so you have to really monitor those closely and account for those. So, how do you avoid pitfalls? A, don't look for a silver bullet, because there, honestly, there isn't one. The best thing that you can do is to try and make adjustments every year in your business, is to sit down and look at your business, look at your business plan, your marketing plan, go through your sales, listen to the feedback from your customers, and make adjustments for your business. It doesn't have to be a huge change, you don't have to revamp everything you did, but small changes add up. And so that's, that's really the best advice that I can give you is to make those adjustments every year. Another thing is to plan for adequate capitalization. So looking at potential risks in production, potential risks in marketing, can you weather a loss? What if you suddenly lost your fish to disease? What if suddenly your market you know, disappears or, or there's an economic downturn and your, your price drops? Can you weather those losses? And the, and the last thing is to not let your business fall too far into debt. And I'll, I'll get into capitalization and debt um, again with, with the later presentation on financial health. But, but those are really kind of the, the methods of avoiding some of the pitfalls that are out there. 
So this is really important. I want to stress that business plans. Um, there is no substitute for this anymore. I mean, there, there's no way around it simply. You have to have a business plan. You have to have a document to help you think through all of the steps of your business, all of the activities in your business, and to have that to look back on at the end of the year and say, this worked, this didn't work, this cost me this much, I thought it was gonna cost me a lot less. And to be able to go back and make these kinds of adjustments within your business. And, 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 that, and I do wanna stress that again, you know, going through that every year is going to pay off in the long run. It really is. So um, again, full disclosure, I have no interest in ag plan. I don't, I mean, they're from the University of Minnesota, but it's not like I own stock or anything. It is completely free for you to use. It is a really, really good program. Uh, Carol and I both like it. It helps you. Now, there may, I, I should also say there may be other programs out there. Wisconsin may have a program like this. I don't know. But this is one that we've used in the past. Um, and other people we've recommended them to use. Ag plan basically goes through and helps you put together your business plan. So if you don't know how to do that, no problem. They go through it, they give you all of the different items that you need to include step by step, a full list of the various things that need to be in that plan. And then even they give you some tips on how to explain this, what to put in there some additional resources on where you can get some more information, some clarification. The thing that I like the most is this one, the samples. They actually give you some samples of what, it would, what you should be writing in this section to give you an idea. Now again, this is not aquaculture specific, but it helps to give you an idea of, hey, this is what it should look like when I fill this part out. And then of course the last part is any comments or notes that those are just for your, yourself to look at later if you want. And, and you can create this account and save it so that you can go back and modify it. The really, really nice thing about it is you can attach your financial statements, you can attach documents to it, so your financial statements that you come up with from Excel. And at the end of it all, it gives you an option to put together a full business plan. And what it does is it formats everything for you, it puts everything in the right order, and you save it as a Word document or a PDF, and you can print it out, and there's your business plan. Your whole business plan, everything put together. And so we know farms that have used this, and you know used it to go to a bank to get a loan. I mean, it, it, this works, it's a good program. So I'd consider, I would advise you to consider using something like this to help you. Again, there may be others from other states that, that work as well, but this is one that we've had experience with. So that kind of covers the adapting to, um, to changing markets portion, and I went through that a little quickly. I'm not sure if it's best for me to take questions after each section, or does anyone have any questions right now or something they'd like me? Yes, sir. Yeah, sure, I'd be happy to do that. That's um, agplan.umn.edu. So getting into strategic marketing, and you know, this is about finding your key market and choosing the right products for those markets. So a successful business is really a, a complex thing, right? And so you have a whole series of decisions that are tied together. Uh, for a business to be successful and to be profitable. So one of those is, of course, your market decisions. And then you have financial decisions that you have to make, management decisions on how to operate and run, personnel decisions, who are you hiring, what kind of people do you need in the business, the scope and scale, so how big are you gonna get, and then, of course, ultimately production decisions. Are you producing right now? Are you holding off? Are you overwintering fish? Are you going to try and you know, crank up the feed? What, what are you going to be doing in terms of production? And so really, this is, this is kind of all of these pieces have to be there together because they all support each other for your business to be profitable. And so that is really challenging. And it also means that successful businesses, generally, our experience has been that when they get in trouble, it's rather serious because they're run really well. So if a business is very successful, it's probably being run really well and people are making good decisions. And so if there is a problem, it very quickly becomes a large problem. And that's also why going back and reevaluating your performance every year 
is a helpful way of, of looking at things so that you can try and catch some of those things early. So a quick reality check. Again, as much as I'd like to give you the cookbook for financial success, there is no such thing, okay? I, just, I, I really have to emphasize that. What works for one person may not work for you. What works in one area may not work for your area. It really is site specific. And also sometimes even species specific or system specific. So that's something important to consider. And so my advice there would be, you know, if you, if you have a particular plan, try and talk to the people that are doing what you want to do in an area similar to where you are located. Because they're going to likely be the most similar to you. But even there, it's not going to be identical. So some of the market-related reasons for business failure. And these are two quotes that, that I, I like because I think they, they cover quite well what some of the challenges sometimes are. Peter Drucker once said that management didn't ask, didn't ask the question, what is our business? What is your business really about? Are you selling a trout fillet? Are you selling an experience? Are you selling the story of your farm, your family farm? Are you, wh what are you selling? Are you selling recreation? Are you selling sustainability? So really the question is, what is your business? What are you doing? Are you producing something? Eric Wagner said that entrepreneurs retreat to a cave instead of thoroughly understanding what their customer needs. This goes back to what, what Chris was saying in the introduction. Understanding what your customer's needs are and trying to fulfill those needs is crucial. If you're providing a very high quality product that doesn't meet anybody's needs, nobody's going to buy that. They're not going to, they're not going to spend money on something they don't need. Each business has to have a unique plan that works for that specific business. So what we see here is, for example, a portable flower truck, right? And it's theflowertruck.com is their website. And so that's, that's kind of a unique twist on something, on an existing concept, right? Flower stores have been around. Now you have a portable flower business. Or this one. I kind of like this one. Rentthechicken.com. I've never tried using it, by the way, so I don't know if it really works, but um, yeah, that, you know, that's something unique, right? It, 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 it gets your interest right away because you're like, hey, we can rent a chicken. Um, but, but that's something that is apparently working for this business. So preparing that strategic business plan, some of the steps involved with that, you know, first, yes, you want to look at your goals, and we're going to talk a little bit more about goals in just a minute. But you want to look at your goals and you want to look at your strengths, your weaknesses, opportunities, and your threats. Then you want to ask yourself, what am I really selling? What, what is the product? What, am I, what are the needs of my consumers? What am I really selling? And of course, to do that, you need to identify who your target customers are. You need to know who you're selling to to know what their needs are. Then you develop your marketing strategy. So then you sit down and you think through all of these different things and say, all right, this is my target consumer. This is the product that I'm going to sell them that will fulfill this need. And then you know, work your way back from there. This last one, I think, is really important. And sometimes we tend to forget to do this and to, to look at this. Uh, feedback is really important. You know, If you're hearing from your customers, if they're making suggestions, that's really useful feedback for you. Um, and sometimes criticism is the best feedback. Uh, you know, um, That gives you an opportunity to revise your production, to revise your financial plans, to revise maybe your marketing plan, maybe try and differentiate your product a little bit. So feedback is really important. And you should really be taking that and putting it back into this whole this whole cycle of business planning. So that when you get feedback, you can adapt to those changes that you're hearing from in the market. So again, setting goals for, for every year. And those include business goals, but also personal goals. And, and, I, and I should stress that. You know, that's really important. Don't forget about what your personal goals are for that business. And looking at both the long term and the short term. Far too often people just think of short term, am I profitable? Yes, I'm profitable, we're good. And they forget to think about long term. Because, for example, I'll tell you, and I give you a little story, like you have a great business. 
um, you know, you come up with this novel, unique idea, and you're selling the product, and you can't keep it on the shelves, and everybody wants it, and so you're doing great, you're, you're chugging along, and everything's wonderful. What, what's the first thing that's going to happen? Anyone want to take a guess? Somebody's going to see your success, and somebody's going to say, hey, they're doing that, and they're doing it well, and they're making money at it. I can do that, too. There's your first competitor, right? So what happens when you get a competitor? Supply goes up. What happens when supply goes up? Generally, price comes down. So planning for the long term, right? Can you, can you sell that product at a lower price? Are you still profitable if that happens? So again, another story and I think this is a good story. Not everybody wants to be the Amazon of whatever industry they're in, right? And I think that's also important, is being realistic and honest with yourself. What are your personal goals? And so this story is about a farm, very successful farm, um, financially in a wonderful, great position, and this farm had the potential to grow and grow and grow and grow and to become this huge company. And the farmer said, when, when Carol approached this person and said, hey, we have some ideas that you, know, you, can, you can capitalize on this and you can take advantage of these trends and you're in a great position to do all this and you have the capital to do it, you know, we, we would think it would be good for you, you could grow your business. And his response was, well, I have my truck, okay, I've got it. I've got my truck, and I've got a dog, and I've got a place to hunt. What else do I need? And this, this gentleman was satisfied. He had met his goals. This is what he wanted for his business. He wanted to produce enough that he could have his truck, have his dog, and take some time off and go hunting. And so it would have been a wrong decision for him to say, I'm going to expand this into this huge company and I'm going to have to hire all these people and, because that's not what his personal goals were. And so I think you know, that story really illustrates the importance of, of accounting for your personal goals too in, in your business planning, not just your business goals. I walk around a lot and the floor is creaking. Can everybody hear that? Hopefully I don't fall through it. Um, again, you know, what, what need does this product of yours fulfill? What unique benefit does your product provide to the consumer? What are you really selling? What is, what is being sold here? Anybody want to take a guess? Oh, I'm sorry, I heard everybody at once. Uh, what was that? Strawberries. Strawberries, okay, any other ideas? Koi, goldfish, right? Okay, yeah, all valid. That, that could be what they're selling. Aquaculture kits. Aquaculture kits, maybe they're selling kits. Maybe they're selling the concept of sustainability, right? I mean, you, all of those could be correct. But that's the, the question that you need to ask yourself and answer for yourself is what am I really selling? What is what the consumer is getting from my product? What is that really? And so, yeah, again, any of those things could be correct. Identifying your target market. This is the challenge, right? How do you identify who wants to buy what you can uniquely provide? Where are those people located that can buy what you can uniquely provide? How many people are there who are going to buy that? Sometimes, you know, we've heard ideas that on the face of them sound like wonderful ideas. Someone's doing something extremely cutting edge, high tech in an area that, you know, this product is never available and, you know, I know that I can get this tr tremendous price for it because whenever it shows up in the supermarket, it's, you know, it's $28 a pound and it flies off the shelves. How many people are there that are really going to buy that product when it becomes available all the time? 
And then, of course, price. Uh, oh, sorry. Well, that's the same one, sorry. Price. What price will they really pay for that product? You know, there's a difference between someone trying something once because it's new and someone coming back and becoming a repeat customer and buying it over and over again. People are often willing to pay a little bit more sometimes the first time to try something and say, all right, we'll give it a try, you know, we'll try it for dinner. But are they gonna come back every time and say, yeah, I'm gonna pay that price every time I wanna eat, you know, trout or perch or whatever it may be that you're trying to grow, shrimp. So how do you find these customers? And I guess this is, you know, getting to the question that you asked me earlier. One of the best things you can do is observe people. And that's not cheap because that means going where they are to observe them. Uh, a story I can tell you about that, I believe it was an executive with Pepsi-Cola, not Coca-Cola, but I could be wrong about that. But before they launched a new product in the UK, they went there. The executive went there and stayed there for several months. And all they did was watch people at bars and restaurants and sit around in cafes and observe people. When were they buying sodas? When were they buying this kind of a product? Were they out with friends? Were they out with family? Was it in the evening? Was it in the in morning? Was it lunchtime? And they learned so much from that experience that when they came back to the US, they revamped their entire marketing strategy for the UK because they realized that the strategy they had developed that they thought they were gonna be successful with wasn't gonna work at all. And it turned out to launch, of course, very successfully because we all know that Pepsi-Cola is a huge company. <laughs> so, but I think you know, that, that's, that's important that if you have an opportunity to go to the stores, to go to the restaurants, or wherever it is that you, know, you think you're gonna be able to sell that product, Observe people, observe you know, the supermarket. Go there and look at the prices, look at people buying it, ask them, talk to them. Ask them what they're looking for in that product. You, know, you see someone pick up a package and look at it and they're, you know, they're looking at it, oh, do I want to, I don't know, do I want to buy this? Because consumers are going through complex decision-making processes in their heads, right? They're trying to look at, is this good value for what I'm getting? Am I getting what I want to get out of this product? And is this the price I want to pay for that? And sometimes just asking them, I mean, maybe not in those terms, but just having a conversation with them can enlighten you a little bit about that process. You know, it's like you see them looking at the packaging and you think, well, what are you looking for? Oh, well, I'm looking to see how much, uh, you know, omega-3 is in this, or I'm looking to see which country this came from, or, you know, things like that. And that might help cue you into some of the things that will fulfill that need that the consumers have. And of course, asking other people, not just consumers, you know, um, asking the supermarket people, the purchasing people, um, wholesale people, you know, just kind of getting an idea of, of where these products are moving to, to find that customer base. And again, with the preferences, ask them. Ask people that are buying your product. Get that feedback from your customers. And yeah, SurveyMonkey's up here, Qualtrics is up here. I like Qualtrics. How many people here have used Qualtrics? It is, it is just oh, so much easier than standing around and asking people questions, right? But, um, but sometimes standing around and asking people questions is still the best way to get an answer, and, and I will admit that. Um, but yeah, you know, observing them, asking them, talking to them, asking others, asking people that are in the industry, you know, hey, what are you finding about, you know, the size, for example, with the walleye? That's a great story. That's a great example. You know, is, is, is that really the size I should be growing? Should I be growing a two-pound fish? Well, no, you know, we actually found that people are trying to buy these one-pounders and because they make these great fillets that fill the baskets. Ah, okay, so I can, I should probably be doing one-pounders then. This is the challenge. And I put shrimp up there, but it could apply to just about anything. You have to find the price that will cover your costs, right? That makes sense. Otherwise, you're not profitable. Can you compete with the price of wild caught and imported shrimp, for example, if you're gonna go into the shrimp business? Is that something you can compete with? Because on some level, you're gonna have to compete with that. And if not, then who is gonna pay the higher price? 
right? Who can you find that will pay a higher price for your locally grown, recirculating, sustainable, you know, environmentally friendly marine shrimp? And then the next question is, how long will they buy that from you? And at what volume? Is this gonna be a product that people only buy for a special occasion? For the holidays, you know, a Christmas dinner or a New Year's Day feast or a 4th of July? Or is this something that they're gonna come back and buy every week or every two weeks? That's gonna matter in terms of your business plan and your marketing and whether you're gonna be able to cover the cost of your production. I think another important thing that sometimes gets overlooked um, is that we have to map out also the distribution system that your business has to deal with to get your product to the market, right? Are you going to be doing that yourself? Are you going to be doing that portion of it yourself? Are you going to buy your own trucks to move your fish around? If so, how many trucks do you need? What is the cost of running those trucks? And regulations come into play then too, right? Because you're adding that on. Another question you need to ask yourself, for example, is will you require a grading facility? Are you trying to sell a particular size product at a particular price point? Do you need a special facility next to your production just so that you can grade that product or hold that product if you need to for a little bit more time? Will you be shipping products? Will you need packaging facilities? Will you need a place to be able to pack, package and box up that product? whether it's live or frozen, or are you going to need extra infrastructure and labor to do this? So a little bit about communication. We heard a little bit about it earlier. Social media is the, the behemoth that's out there. Um, I'd like to tell everybody that social media is wonderful, but it is a double-edged sword. There are expectations that come with using social media. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about that because I think it's important to realize. Social media is great if you know how to work the platform. And by that I mean, you know, how often are people expecting to hear from you? You know, things on, for example, um, some of these sites, you know, Facebook has a little bit more of a permanent presence. But on Twitter, if you put something on Twitter, how long is it really going to be in front of people? How long are people really going to look at that one tweet before it vanishes into the void and they never see it again? So if you plan on using that, that's fine. But you need to be aware that you need to continuously be communicating to that audience. Because once you put it out there, it's not out there for very long. And so the question I think people need to ask themselves is, am I prepared to do that? Do I have the time to say, yeah, I'm going to tweet something out every day, right? I'm going to take a picture of something, or I'm going to post something, or I'm going to link to something every day to engage that audience. Because if you don't do that, you're not going to engage that audience. People may follow you, but they're not actually looking at what you're sharing if you're not updating things. So that's just something I want to put out there. So I mean, I think that is important, right? You, you have to use the platforms in the way that they can be most effective for you. And of course, there's still traditional media that, that does have uh, viewership. So I think if I had to summarize everything I just talked about in one question, I guess the best way to put it would be, what can you be the best at selling, at growing and at selling, that your targeted customers want to buy at the price that's profitable for you? That's really the question that you need to answer to come up with your strategic marketing plan. And again, like I mentioned, that Ag Plan program, part of that program is just coming up with a marketing plan. So it does guide you through the different elements of who is your target, where is your target, what is the need that you're fulfilling for that target to help you kind of think through those things. But that's really what it boils down to. What specific products will be the best to meet those needs? What size of product? Again, the example of the one pound walleye. When do they want this product? Weekends? People only want it on weekends, on a Friday, on a 4th of July. What form do they want that in? Do they want it live? 
Do they want it filleted, processed, value added with, you know, again, Doritos. Ch I got to try that. I mean, now I have to go try that, you know. Does he still make that? I don't know. I, I have to ask him because, yeah, I, now I have to try that. Do your customers want variety? Is that what they're looking for? Are they, are they looking to be able to come back to you and have something a little bit different every time? Are they perfectly satisfied with having the same thing over and over? What, what do your customers want? And how much variety? If they want variety, that's great, but how much? Are they just looking to switch off two or three different things? Are they looking for something new every day? And that all depends, again, on who is your target market? Who is your targeted customer? How many different products can you manage in your, in your business efficiently? That's another big challenge. You know, sometimes, um, and this came up yesterday actually, you know, there's, there's a lot that you can do, for example, with uh, waste products. Or there's a lot that you can do with, say, oh, hey, I have some excess water, maybe I can do this, you know, I can grow some of this alongside what I'm doing. Th there's nothing wrong with that conceptually, but the question is, can you manage that alongside your primary activity? Can you, can, do you really have the time or the skills or whatever equipment you need to manage that successfully alongside the primary production activity that you're doing? Because if not, it's only gonna become a cost. And so then it's not really worth putting the time into that. So that's just something to think about is, you know, yes, maybe my customers want 12 different varieties of whatever I'm producing. But I can't manage 12 different varieties. And so then that's not an appropriate decision for your business to make. Maybe just manage three or four varieties. And then try and, you know, if you want to ramp up, try and ramp up to meet whatever the demand is. But, you know, that's something that you need to assess for yourself. And that, you know, ties back into your personal goals as well. Do you need processing? Do you need processing in-house? Or can you send that out to someone else? If you do, that's gonna change your operations, it's gonna change your costs, it's gonna change infrastructure, capital requirements, regulatory requirements. You know, you're gonna need HACCP, uh, which may require training if you don't already have that. So these are all things to consider. Distribution, right? How, how are you gonna get it out there? Are they gonna come pick it up at the farm? Are you gonna deliver it to a central location, a wholesaler? Um, are you going to deliver it door to door to restaurants? You know, one of the things I talked to a seafood distributor one time and I was amazed at the challenges they go through. Granted, this was in Las Vegas, so you know, that's kind of a crazy town to begin with. But hearing from them, you know, the effort that goes into just getting things on the trucks and then out to the hotels every morning, every day, that they have to do that. And I've actually talked to some fish farmers that do the same. Right, that wherever they are, they're delivering right into supermarkets, fresh, or restaurants, or whatever it may be. And, you know, the time that it takes to do that, getting stuck in traffic. You know, if you're delivering fish to restaurants in Chicago, that might be a great high-end market. But you're dealing with Chicago traffic. Can you keep the fish fresh? Can you make those deliveries on time? Is that something you want to do? Do you want to spend three hours in traffic every morning? So those are all questions to think about. Marketing strategies, so the big thing that often comes up is promotions, messaging, advertising, and you should have an advertising plan that's part of your marketing plan. It's how are you going to get your message out, right? Um, there's a lot here. I mean, there's a lot of avenues that you can pursue, the internet, uh, which I agree is a great platform because, again, social media is largely free. Websites are not always free. Um, but you know, everybody uses the internet today, so that's, that's a great way to go. Television, I mean radio, print, newspaper, a lot of this is informed really by who is your target market, right? If your target market is someone that does not want to be within five feet of a smartphone, being on Twitter is not gonna help you. I mean, it, you know, these are kind of common sense things, but they are things that you have to think about and think through while you're developing your business plan. If the area where you're in has really poor internet service, maybe a wife, maybe having a website isn't the most useful thing. Now, if you're selling outside of that area, you might need a website. But, you know, maybe for that local market, it's not the best way to go. Maybe you're better taking an ad out in the paper, the local paper. 
or a flyer, sending a flyer around. And again, you know, this, I stress this because it really is important. This, this whole, oh, I went a little too far there. This whole marketing plan that you put together has to inform your business plan. This has to go back into your business plan. Once you've thought through all these things, who is my target customer? What am I selling? What need of theirs am I fulfilling? Look at the rest of your business plan and say, do these things match up? Am I going to be producing the product that I am actually going to be able to sell at a profit with my plan that I have here, with this facility that I've designed, in the location that I've picked, with the production system and technology that I'm using? Do I have all the right permits and licenses? Can I get those to be able to do what I need to do? Right? And, and another thing, you know, customer service. I'll take a minute to talk about that. I think I'm, ooh, 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 I'm running out of time. Well, real quickly then, you know, there, there's examples of some farms that survive on customer service. You know, they sell their product for a premium, higher price than others, and why do the people keep coming back to them anyway? Partially because of quality, but also partially because of customer service. They build a relationship with those customers. They take the time to get to know those customers. And so the customer eventually learns, this is somebody that will fulfill my need, that I can talk to, and that I can say, hey, you know what? It'd be really great if I could get this in this size, or it'd be really great if I can get, you know, uh, on this specific date because I need it for whatever reason. And so if you can provide that kind of customer service, that might also give you an advantage, a competitive advantage, because people build that relationship with you and they know that you're going to fulfill their need. So they'll come back to you. And of course, the financial plan. And with that, I left the, uh, the best for last, I suppose. Um, and also the longest, so maybe I didn't time that quite right. <laughs> so uh, financial success, uh, and I'll try and move through this to stay on track. I don't want uh, to throw off anybody that comes after me. But really, there's three pillars for financial success in your business. And the first is cash flow, then comes your financial position and profitability. I'm going to say right now, I'm not going to talk about profitability. Profitability is just making sure that you can cover your costs and have excess money after that, right? That's profit. So that one's pretty straightforward. It's not easy to achieve, but that one's pretty straightforward as a concept. What is profitability? So let's talk a little bit about cash flow and financial position. And like I said earlier, and I alluded to yesterday, cash flow is the number one thing that we see that becomes a problem for businesses. And you know, these three pillars are what keep your business up. If one of these falls, that could bring the whole thing down. So where does cash go in your business? How does cash move through your business? And why are cash flow problems so common? Well, that's because cash is always moving through the business. You have cash coming into the business, cash going out of the business, debt payments that you make, new equipment that you have to buy, receivables, um, inventory, and then of course these unexpected expenses, right? You have uh, a well that goes out, a pump that goes out. Now you have to replace an entire pump or you have a vehicle that's damaged and needs repair. And renovations to uh, uh, meet building codes, for example. You have an inspector that comes by and says, hey, this isn't up to code, you gotta change this. You know, you gotta fix this. You have to address that right away. So that's an expense that comes out of your business that you didn't plan for. And so that's why cash flow problems oftentimes become so common. And given the amount capital that's typically used in an aquaculture business, because aquaculture is a capital intensive business, even at small scale it can be capital intensive. You know, two of the key questions that you need to ask yourself are, what is my cash balance right now? How much cash do I have right now in my business? And the other question is, and what do I expect my cash to be like in six months? Am I getting money in? Am I spending more money over the next six months? What does that look like for my business? I like this picture. Um, this is cash flow. Okay, this is my depiction of cash flow. Um, you want to be watching your cash flow at all times. You want to know what it's doing. You want to know where it is. You want to know which direction it's going. You want to know if it's going up, if it's coming down. What's it doing? Because it's going to matter. And it'll get you. <laughs> 
And how often should you be doing that? How often should you be looking at cash flow? Honest answer, most people don't like this one, monthly. The real answer is monthly. Cash flow is not something you should look at once a year. That's something you should really be monitoring every month. And sometimes even more frequent than that, if your activities demand that. But really, at least monthly, you should be looking at your cash flow. Common pitfalls for developing that cash flow budget. It's not fun to do, but it's necessary. Overly optimistic yields, right? Thinking that you're gonna produce 100%, no mortality, everything's gonna be flawless. You know, this system did wonderfully at the research station. I'm gonna get, you know, 3,000 pounds an acre or whatever it may be. I mean, over optimistic yields. Overly optimistic sales. Do you sell everything you produce? That doesn't really happen. You generally don't sell everything that you produce. So assuming that your sales are 100% of your production, that may be overly optimistic. Underestimating your expenses. Omitting capital replacement items, right? Maintenance, replacements of vehicles, other pieces of equipment, machinery that you have that you rely on and omitting loan interest and principal payments. We've seen some people that just leave that off their cash flow and then suddenly find that, oops, I spent more money than I thought I did. So really, the point is, watch your cash and protect it. Do everything you can to protect it. Pay attention to those details and try and do that monthly because it, it will, it will, you'll see the shark coming before it does and that might give you an opportunity to change course. So a quick cash flow uh, checklist. I just want to say that a lot of this information here, especially this, this third presentation, you can find a lot of this on the Southern Regional Aquaculture Center fact sheets. There are some excellent fact sheets there written by Carol and others that cover all of these financial metrics, how to interpret them, how to calculate them with these tables that you see here. Just to give you an idea, I'm not gonna linger very much, but basically you're looking at your ending cash balance, your outstanding operating loans, your uh, cash flow coverage ratio, you know, and, and filling in just this simple rubric, kind of where am I at? Am I on a problem zone? Am I marginal? Am I in a good position? And just kind of going through that, you know, every month or kind of gives you an idea of where you stand. So, like I said, I'm gonna try and stick to the time. So, um, managing cash flow, what are some short-term strategies for that? New borrowing, line of credit. Right? That's one way to help kind of cover cash shortfalls. Rescheduling your loan payments. Establishing clear payment terms with your lender. Keeping the bank informed, that's a big one. If the bank doesn't know what's happening, they may not have faith or confidence in you. If you sit down with them and say, hey look, this is what's going on, I'm doing this and this to correct it. I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna try this. We're gonna change this, we're gonna sell this here. We're gonna offset some of this cost your banker's more likely to work with you and not just hit you with a notice because they see what's happening in the business, they have an understanding that you're trying to resolve it. Slow expansion, slow down your expansions. If you're having cash flow challenges, don't spend extra money, don't spend more money. Try and slow down on expansions and renovations. So surviving cash flow shortfalls, delay those large capital purchases like new equipment. Don't go out and buy a brand new backhoe if you have cash flow challenges. Collect all the receivables. Make sure that you got all of the receivables that you're owed, right? Don't let those linger out there. Make sure to do that. Get rid of any stale merchandise, even if that means at a discount, right? Sometimes just selling that to help meet what your costs are helps bring cash into the business and then you can keep operating. And selling or leasing back assets like tractors. You know, that's not something you'd ideally want to do, but if you have to, if the situation requires and dictates, you may have to sell off some equipment. Um, talk to your suppliers. Try and see if you can get an extended term. If you're a good customer, maybe they'll, they'll give you some slack. Maybe they'll say, okay, you know, you can make a partial payment or you can, we'll, we'll let you go another month. Um, again, that liquidating assets, that's kind of a last resort. You don't want to have to do that um, unless it's a very, very dire situation, but it is an option. And also choosing which bills to pay, right? You want to pay your payroll first. You want to pay your crucial suppliers, such as feed. You want to ask others maybe if you can skip a payment or make that partial payment. 
and see if they'll allow you to do that. And again, having a relationship here is what helps because you know, people are more inclined to work with you when they know you and when they have that established relationship with you. So then quickly, the last six minutes, financial position. So you get this basically from your balance sheet, right? This is a statement of your finances. And really the big one here is looking at your debt to asset ratio. And if that's greater than 50%, that may be cause for concern. Now, I should say that also depends on where you are in your business, right? If you're a startup company and you've just invested a whole bunch of money and bought new facilities and new equipment, your debt to asset ratio is gonna look different than when you're five or 10 years down the road. So that is something important to keep in mind. It's not just a, a blanket, oh, if you're over 50%, you're in trouble. But really what that tells you is whether you're gonna hold them or fold them, right? Are you in a position where you can salvage it or can you turn the company around and lower your debt or, or not? Are you beyond that? And so this kind of a chart gives you an idea. Generally what, what's defined as low risk is if you're under a 50% debt to asset ratio. Moderate risk is over 50%, and if you're over 100% debt to asset ratio, you're considered high risk. And if you get too far over that, that just leads to foreclosure. And that's, you know, everyone wants to avoid that. So kind of the financial checklist for your financial position is looking things at like the current ratio, uh, looking at your debt to asset ratio and your net worth. And I guess I'll talk about profitability just really briefly. Um, net farm income. Is that positive or negative, right? Did you make money or did you not make money? Um, and again, refer to the S-Track uh, fact sheets for information. Businesses have to be adequately capitalized. How will you replace equipment if your business doesn't generate enough money for that replacement? That's something you need to account for in your financial statements, depreciation of your items. Do you have enough equipment to handle an emergency? Right? Do you have a tractor that you could lower into a pond to aerate so you don't lose all your fish? And risk is always a hidden cost, right? Don't take research yields and assume that that's gonna be what you're gonna get in production because oftentimes research doesn't account for the probability of losses from disease or other factors because that's not what they're looking for. They're looking for the best formulation of a diet or the best, you know, whatever it may be, the best temperature or, so they're not really looking at things in terms of, you know, profitability. Don't take equipment that you already own and assume that you can use it for two different activities. You know, one of those, for example, the fish crop may require that tractor more than you think it does. And so don't just assume, I already have a tractor, so I'll be fine. I don't need to worry about replacing it or getting another tractor because I've already got one. Well, you may end up needing more than one to, to deal with the emergencies and whatever other activities you have. We've seen some budgets that don't include the cost of pond construction and the annual depreciation of that. That could be the same for tanks or systems or biofilters, right? That becomes a problem because where will you get the money from to rebuild those or replace those systems if you need to. If you're not accounting for that in your financial statements, then you come up to the point where you have to replace that and all of a sudden it's an unexpected cost and you don't have the cash to cover that maybe. This is an important point I'd like to make for a minute too, and I realize I'm running out of time, but um, labor. Oftentimes people don't account for the value of their own labor, you know, especially when it's a, a family business we see that people don't include a value for their labor. And the reality is that the farm has to make enough money to compensate you for your time, right? I mean, farmers, just like everybody else, may need to pay for college for their, their kids, insurance, retirement. You know, benefits can be up to 25% or more. So that's something to account for in your planning, right? The value of your time. Because farmers, just like everybody else, get tired of working long hours without compensation. You're not gonna do it very long if you feel like you're not being compensated for it fairly. So quickly, Nathan Stone, and to go back to Walmart, <laughs> um, Nathan Stone's Walmart test. Anybody here know Nathan Stone? Okay, Nathan's a riot, he's fun. He's very quiet though. Um, so this is what we should be asking people. 
Can you make as much money from a small scale aquaculture facility as you can as a greeter at Walmart? And if the answer is no, then you're better off working at Walmart where you can be warm <laughs> and out of the rain. And really, even hobby farmers need to make money, right? Even if you're just doing this as a hobby, even if you're not looking to become a huge commercial enterprise, it needs to pay for itself. Again, no silver bullets. Plan for adequate capitalization. Maintain adequate cash flow through your business. Farms that make adjustments every year are successful even if it's a small adjustment, even if it's saying, I'm going to try and lower my debt 5% next year. I'm going to try and improve my position on you know, sales by 2% next year. Even small changes. People that try and avoid getting themselves into too much debt before taking an action, right? If you're seeing that your debt is accumulating, your cash flow does not look good, it looks negative, try and do something about it early. So again, in summary, you really need to look at cash flow, you need to look at your financial position, and is what you're doing profitable? Monitor cash flow monthly. I can't stress that enough. Do a financial checkup of your business at the end of every year. Identify and prioritize your weaknesses, set the goals to improve those weaknesses, and make those little adjustments every year in your business. I'm from Urban Organics. Uh, we're an aquaponic facility in uh, St. Paul, Minnesota. Uh, we're in the heart of St. Paul. Um, so we're right near in close proximity to market. Um, here's a video of us uh, farming. This is how we move around and harvest our product. And so part of this is, you know, engaging with our customers and they really enjoy that we are able to um, show them videos like this on our social media and having them take a look at, you know, this is how we farm and they think this is, this is high tech farming. This is part of what tells our story. Um, so here's a picture of our website and <clears throat> our website really doesn't have any of our products but it, what it does have is our story and customers like that you know customers you can get lettuce anywhere so we're selling more than lettuce we're selling more than fish we're selling a story and that's extremely important um, because the market is saturated you can get lettuce anywhere you can get fish anywhere but it's how you tell your story that counts especially in RAS farming so here are some of the things that we as a company uh, value. Farming sustainably. Um, I can't tell you how many customers, enough how, how many customers we have because we're farming and we're farming the right way, sustainably. We also are, because we are in close proximity to the market, um, we play a pivotal role in our community. You know, we are a community player and we care for our community and we care for our customers and that's part of the reason why our customers co keep coming back to us. Um, we also want to share the highest quality product um, that goes to freshness. Um, we are really close to the market and we can get produce and fish same day if we want to. Transparency. Now this is one that um, is extremely important to us as a company because there is a lot of confusion out there in the marketplace and I'll get th to that in a, a little bit here. Um, we also practice the triple uh, bottom line for valuing social, environmental, and uh, financial costs and that we, we measure that and we can see how much we grow with uh, aspects as far as social and environmental and at the end of the year we can take a look at our financial growth and look at that. Um, we act locally. Um, this is important. This is kind of the message that we send to our customers. We lessen environmental transportation cross, uh, cross states. Uh, we encor uh, encourage local economy. Um, we try to source things locally that we need, like our clamshells, like our labels. And that, that's extremely important to us. 
Um, like I said, you know, we can harvest same day. Um, I think the production um, is only half of the puzzle. You have to locate your farm in close proximity to lower some of these costs. <coughs> Focus on the environment. Um, a lot of our customers, uh, they, they, this is huge for them because they, they care about the environment. They want to make a difference. Um, saving, we save on lights because we use LED. We, we save on water because we are a RAS aquaponics facility. Um, and we also renovated two existing, pre-existing buildings. So that goes back to the community aspect. Um, you know, we really want to change these neighborhoods um, and change the way that our community lives. <coughs> because we, uh, we, we also use no pesticides, um, so we, we keep everything in the house. And we also grow vertically to maximize um, just our growing area. So here's a big one, the organic certification. There's a lot of confusion out there as far as labeling. So when you see on a label, um, nature, you know, natural. What is natural? What is sustainable? And we use this USDA organic certification because it's, it's straightforward. Um, it's straightforward, there is no confusion, and we have to go through this third party certifier, MCIA, um, as our third party certifier, which gives it credibility, which gives it an unbiased <coughs> uh, perspective. Um, so because of we are organic, obviously on the production side, it puts all kinds of lim limitations on what we can use for production. Um, and it makes the farming aspect an incredibly tougher to do. But in return, you get that certification and that's how we keep our customers. We, and that's huge for us. Um, so anyone that's looking into getting into organic um, farming, I mean, you have, to, you have to do this to keep your customers, be, keep that transparency with your customers. Um, you know, we are trying to stay away from using things, using labels like natural or sustainable uh, because of that. So our biggest means by which we communicate with our um, customers is through our label, you know. When they go to a store and they see our label, we have to tell them a story. We have to educate them. A lot of people um, in the, in the uh, marketplace, they don't understand. You know, they don't know what aquaponics is. So we have to show that to them. And that's what we use these logos for. Plants and fish grown in perfect harmony. And while that doesn't tell the whole story, they might ask them questions. You know? <laughs> they might be curious about trying to figure out you know, what does that mean. So because we are organic, uh, we have to use integrated pest management. That goes into the production. Um, you know, there are limitations with that. And so we have to keep things as natural as possible. And so we use integrated pest ma management as our tool. We also are part of the Seafood Watch. Um, you know, this is important to our customers. We try to um, promote this idea of, you know, we are taking pressure off commercial farming by providing fish, by providing um, good seafood locally. Um, and when that organic, while there is no organic certification for fish, you know, we want to be ready. So we are doing things as sustainably um, and as environmentally friendly as possible. So again, proximity to market. Uh, I t see this too many times where the farm is just located too far from the market. You know, transportation costs are huge for those farms. Here, you know, we are five miles away from our distribution center, or from distribution. Here's a time lapse. So we actually use videos like this to engage our customers on social media. We have over 40,000 uh, followers on Facebook, and that's how we keep our customers coming back. Um, videos like this, and they're, they're really curious, and we want to educate them on what we're doing. It's pretty cool. So, 
local air quality, you know, obviously, like I said, we're, we, we don't have that transportation. Our carbon footprint is small. And we are finding more and more that that's, that's very important to our customers. Um, we, they, they care and they, they support us. That's part of the reason. You have to build this relationship with your customers. And it starts with trust and transparency. So the, this idea of food deserts, uh, this is kind of how my company uh, was founded on this principle. You know, we have, as a company, we have this greater obligation to our community. Um, you know, a lot of low-income neighborhoods, like the buildings, the abandoned buildings that we have now um, as our farms, you know, they were in low-income neighborhoods. And we are actually trying to turn uh, the, those communities around. Um, there's actually 12 food deserts within the city of St. Paul. As you can see here, this is our, Schmidt, or our Hams location on the east side of St. Paul. And then our, right down here is where our Schmidt facility is. Um, so there's huge implications on our community. We want to be a community player um, and we want to make a difference. So we partner with the fish guys um, as our main fish distri distributor uh, distribution. And as Raz farmers, we have to kind of kick this negative stigma on fish farming. I think there's no question about you know the environmental impacts that traditional aquaculture has on the environment. And if we can show that to our customers with <clears throat> just how sustainable we are as RAS farmers and aquaponic farmers, you know, they appreciate that. And that's what keeps them paying. They will have to pay a higher price because it costs more to farm this way. But they don't mind. So how does our label um, share, help share our vision? You know, this is, we do it through these three logos plus this organic certification. We also have to have our uh, third party certifier down here on our lo label. Um, but they, we want them to make the most educated, we want them to be educated to be able to make their own decisions when choosing the products they consume. Um, <clears throat> and we want to make sure that they know how it's being produced and they know it's being uh, produced sustainably. So here's a picture. We actually work with a marketing company called Golden Sun um, in the city and they specialize in this <clears throat> marketing produce. And so we've been working them with, very closely with them and they've helped us a lot through some of our challenges that we've faced. So as we have started off, uh, HAMS, like I said, back in 2013, uh, HAMS was just getting started and we had Lunds and Byerly's and Birchwood Cafe in St. Paul. Those were our two main outlets. And now we are in several restaurants, uh, Spoon and Stable, it's a James Beard award-winning restaurant, Birchwood Cafe, Nolo's Kitchen, High V, Kowalski's Local Crate, Seward, Octo Fish Bar. So we work with all kinds of different restaurants. They, they believe in us, is that's, there's no secret, you know? You have to be able to tell your story and you have to have support. You have to have a good working relationship with your uh, customers. Now this was unexpected. Um, unexpected and there's huge potential here. Uh, you have to be able to, to look at your product and look at different outlets. Um, and these are unconventional outlets. Um, health partners, is hospitals and clinics. We actually, um, they, they approached us because they believed they saw what we were doing and they wanted to provide health, uh, healthy, fresh produce to their patients. Um, they really wanted to care, they cared about their patients, they cared about the community. And now they, the, the, the response has been overwhelming. Now they supply our clamshells and I think we're looking at getting into three or four more hospitals. So you have to be creative. Being creative is huge in this because you, you're not gonna make it unless you, you change, you adapt with uh, the changing market 
and you have to be creative. So here's a couple pictures, twin kales. We have uh, around nine different salad blends. Patio mix, finely spring mix, classic duo, just arugula, mommy blend, river city mix, finely spring, and wow, that was really short. But <laughs> I'll leave you with this. This fresh equals nutritious, nutritious e equals healthy, fish and plants, help each other grow. I mean, that's our mission. Um, and it comes down to having that support from your community, having a good business relationship with your customers, and just being a, being a, a player in your community. My name's Grant Johnson. I'm with Plymouth Springs Fish Company. Um, I, I know I'm the only thing between you guys and lunch. So I um, thought we'd kind of mix it up. You guys have been flooded with information, a lot of great content. Um, definitely, I, I'm looking forward to having it all published, and there's a lot to digest. But I think this is a boot camp, right? This is interaction, and there, you know, I, I kind of like to know what I'm dealing with, who, who's in the audience. Um, let's see. If you raise your hand, if you are, you haven't started a fish farm, you're just here learning wow awesome okay wow perfect all right who wants to stand up and tell their story we've heard a theme about a story um good first hand up go ahead just just say your name yep and and what your story is and my story is i want to help people eat better awesome my, my idol is norman borlaug the guy who won the nobel peace prize for saving millions of people's lives throughout the world from doing simple things to produce better food and that means everything. People shouldn't have to worry about food. That's awesome. That's a man after my own heart. Um, these were just smoked by us, so we're going to give out some uh, give out some smoked fish. Thanks for sharing your story. Absolutely. Um, all right. Who, who wants to go next? Yes. All right. All right. One of the one of the new folks again who hasn't hasn't. They're just here to learn, but they have a story. What's something they they're here? Yeah. Go ahead. So we're a small group of, of people who are angels. Our first name ourselves and our family and we would like to see for our children to grow healthily mm -hmm. and that is our first priority but we also want to make a living at it and so we've been in research for about three years mm -hmm. um and oh yeah i met you guys last year yeah yeah, yeah. they're part of the boot camp yeah um i more want to be on the business end of it and the marketing side Mm -hmm. um, and so I've done a lot of research that way. Cool. So we've got different parts of our team that people with different strengths mm -hmm. to sort of come in together and make this work. Um, and so we're looking for capital and we're kind of, um, I was saying to Peter last night, I'm a little bit too old to start from like minimum wage. And so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We, we're looking at finding, uh, there's lots of people who care about this. Um, I know a lot of wealthy people, and so we're going to start there with mm -hmm. getting some bigger players on board um, and trying to, like, I'm applying for a fellowship soon through the Open Society, trying to get a project going to address um, what our last speaker just said, which is to raise the amount of fish eaten in the United States. Um, it's been done with beef and chicken and milk just needs a good marketing campaign behind it and right. we can actually change how people, people are right view here. fish as part of their diet. Perfect, that's amazing, awesome, there you go. Thank you. No, this is great. I, I think this is all really in line with, you know, what we've been hearing, which is, you know, tell your story and do what you want to do. I mean, I think all of us could have gotten a job or, or go take a job or have a job where, you know, you're not happy or you don't like the people you work with or you know so I think I think the focus really to kind of table all of the information all the content you've gotten today I would I would just first focus on what do you like to do like like what 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 do you what do you want to do what's your mission what's your passion what you know everybody doesn't have to grow to be you know a hundred million dollar uh, fish business I mean the nice thing is you've heard from folks today that have PhDs and that have big businesses and 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 that have been successful but I think what, what we're gonna, what I'm gonna talk about is, you know, we're, we're at your level, by the way. We, we just started, we're 
20 months into this. This is my second conference here. Um, and, and we're learning what it is that we're good at and what we're not good at. We're taking a lot of losses, which is good, fa you know, failures, and, and, and we're learning from those. And we're just doing stuff. So I think the key is to, to do it, but also realize who are you and, and what do you want to do and why, why did you get into this to begin with? Because if you start chasing the dollar or the magic bullet, like we heard it from Dr. John, which by the way, my knock on this conference has always been that we kind of all sit here and we, we have the science down, we have so many experts, um, but you guys, you know, Dr. Hartlib and Dr. John like delivered on the, on the content. I mean, I would, I would take those, those, all that information that they presented and just really take it to heart. But, you know, you have to also think, what do you want to do? Do you want to be a marketer? Do you want to, you know, raise your hand if you love to be on your phone and you love posting things to Instagram uh, and you love being on Facebook. Not that many of you, which I, I figure, if you really enjoy that, like, like, and the only thing I would respectfully disagree with in some of the talks is, this is everything, like, like, this is every, like, this is not going away, and I have four daughters that, you know, I dread the day that they, they want phones, but the reality is, it, it, it's, it's getting more and more, my wife doesn't have a computer anymore, this is all she, you know, you know, I see, I see some of the millennials and the, the younger folks, you know, nodding their head, Question. So, Dr. Hartlib, this is your daughter, and what's your name? Abby. Abby. And what do you? Sorry to put you on the spot, Abby. Uh, and how old are you? Twelve. Twelve. Okay, I have an eleven-year-old. So, what do you spend most of your time on the phone doing? Like, what? What? Where are you on the phone? Snapchat. Snapchat. Who's on Snapchat? Okay, more than I would expect. Okay, that's good. <laughs> p p people think, oh, this is annoying, and this is, you know, who's doing this? I promise you there are 60 year old men in here who sent a poop emoji last night to somebody. Like, <laughs> that happened, that happened. Like, they're on this, right? So if you're not on this, if you're not telling your story, which is the most important part, and it does, by the way, it doesn't have to be to, you know, it doesn't have to be like um, necessarily directly to the end consumer. I know, we're, I know I'm here to talk a little bit about what we're doing and what we think our efforts are gonna you know, pay off to do. You can just be telling your story and putting out content, but if you're not doing it and you're not getting it to the individuals that are getting to the direct to consumer and getting the premium for your product, because by the way, a little bit about me, I live in Ohio and people are like, what the hell do you have a fish farm in Wisconsin for? And you know, wh why are you even here? And that was the first question I got when I showed up at the farm. Um, a little bit about how I ended up there was my wife's family's from Milwaukee. Um, I've always been kind of a fish nerd. I'm part of the, uh, just, just as a hobby by the way, and, and as fun, I'm part of the um, you know, Ohio State Aquaculture Association, which is part of the North Central, which included Wisconsin. A farm in Plymouth came up, I fell in love with it. I was gonna move my family, my four daughters and my wife up to uh, rural Wisconsin and live on the fish farm. And, and I, I came home and told my wife about it and she said, great, uh, you, but you're gonna do that with a different wife and different kids. So <laughs> I, had to, I had to rethink my plan. Uh, so so I, I started looking around at, you know, I, don't, I didn't know anything about fish health or um, you know, fish biology or you know, just from what I'd learned of going to a couple conferences or, or reading online. Um, but I knew there were a lot of really talented individuals that are going to school for that or grew up in that and, and love what they do and that's their passion, that's their story. So that was my mission is to engage those folks. Um, and actually, that's sort of the point of this conference is you know, to build a community, to learn from each other and to, and to um, get some great resources out of it. And that's how um, you know, I ended up meeting most of the team really. So j just real quick, so uh, Scott Cooper, if you could stand up. Um, Scott, I met when he presented uh, here last year. Um, and I was just like, I gotta have that kid, and um, he's, he's super passionate about what he does, and he, he has this great r rapport with people. Um, so, so I went after him, and little did I know, you know, three other companies were going after him as well, and then, uh, you know, we, we were fortunate enough to, you know, uh, decide to spend the time, energy, and money on, on our team. So, so Scott came on board, and he's been a blessing. Derek, if you could stand up real quick. So Derek has the, uh, he, he, he grew up with this farm in his uh, family. So he's always been around it. 
Um, he, he knew it, he didn't go to school for it, but he had a passion for it. Um, he had built a business plan for a business like this. He, uh, you know, he just wanted to learn and, and, and he realized that he was taking a huge pay cut, um, but he was going to be out on the farm and, and doing something that he loved every day. And a real quick little funny story about Derek is immediately we wanted to put up I know, sorry I did not uh, prep you for any of this. Um, we wanted to put up cameras, right? Because I'm in Ohio and I want to see stuff and I want to show my friends that have no idea what a fish farm is or, you know, what is this? And Derek was, I mean, we got into it. I mean, Derek was like, I got into this so I could have, you know, I could be out on the farm and not worried about Big Brother and, you know, this is like a beautiful place and you're going you're gonna to put me on, you know, reality TV show, you know, <laughs> and everybody's going to be calling me and saying, you know, what are you doing? You know, because we did raise some money and uh, uh, I have a couple of friends, investors that, that put money into this operation and um, he, he said, they're all going to be calling me and saying, well, what are you doing there? Why are you doing that? And I said, Derek. They, they don't care that much. I mean, they, they, they really don't, and, and, and I don't. I said, it's just cool to be able to, sh you know, pull it up and, and show people. So uh, he sort of won because the cameras still aren't up. Yeah, they're still not up. So <laughs> one of the downsides of not being there all the time is you don't get to make all the decisions. Um, so, so Derek's been great, and, and Derek, um, you know, kind of, kind of like this whole theme of deciding what it is that you want to do and what's passion. I mean, the, the two stories, the three stories that were told. I mean, that's that's amazing. That's that's where you want to start. Like that's your passion, and then go all in on that. Um, and, and you know, don't spread yourself too thin. So, um, you know, Derek had asked me, "What are you going to talk about? Like, we just started doing this. Like, what do you, what do you even know?" And I said, "Well." <laughs> Well, well, I'm going to talk about what we've done and, and, and where we're headed and, 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 and why we're doing it and it might not work and we'll change direction and do something else. Um, so, uh, you know, Derek had a lot of good questions which actually kind of like prompted me. Derek loves to ask questions so um, that was the key uh, to all that. We also call him Dr. No. I just today started Dr. No because he says no to everything. He's very conservative, he wants to drag it out and have everything, you know, P's and Q's. So I thought, you know, this is a guy who should deal with regulations and HACCP and, you know, you know, just, you know, all of the submittals and everything and, and process and in the processing room. So like knowing what your business wants to do and then within that business knowing what you love to do, that's sort of what we've started doing on our team is don't do something you don't like and that, that you suck at, by the way. I mean, do, do, do f focus on your strengths. Don't always try to be fixing what you're, what you're bad at. Um, so anyway, Derek, you can sit down now. Uh, and, and then through Scott, we got somebody else from Lake Superior State University, um, Luke Bradburn, stand up. Um, I'm just going in no particular order. Um, actually, I would have started with Rachel if I was going best to worst, but, um, <laughs> but uh, Luke, uh, Luke came on as a recommendation. We had somebody who I thought was going to live on the farm and, and it was going to be, you know, his dream job. And we went through, you know, you know a year with him. And, um, you know, then we got into the processing of fish. And, you know, he, perfect example, he realized he hated processing. And he happened to live on the farm where the processing plant was, facility plant. It's a box a room. <laughs> And uh, he, he, he hated it and uh, it wasn't for him and he wanted the farm to be something different. He wanted it to be pumpkin rides and stocking fish and that's just not where we were headed. So, you know, he decided to go in a different route. We were for fortunate to get Luke. So Luke lives on our farm in Westfield and Luke um, uh, is, is there with his wife and their, their newborn child and um, is the eyes and ears there. So um, Luke's, Luke's been fantastic. And then Rachel, Rachel who by the way, don't uh, don't don't be fooled. She will roll up her sleeves and take any of these guys to task any day, and uh, and and outwork them. But but Rachel's been uh, you know a godsend. Um, Rachel came and followed you know Scott's passion away from her passion, which is the ocean, and and came to uh, inland and and has really added an incredible balance and female perspective. Remember, I have four daughters, so I'm a a feminist, a feminist and you know I really believe in you know that there's a completely different mindset that that comes with Rachel and and then when we got into the customer service end of things realized Rachel is really good with the customers on the phone she's she's naturally you know just nice and uh, and and it it comes up 
Scott, don't shake your head no. Um, so um, Rachel, Rachel's realizing what, what she's really good at, and we're, we're trying to do more of that so that Rachel can do what, what she's good at. And, and attention to detail and quality control and you know, looking at the fish and being like, no, this is not what we think should go out, and then raising that to our attention, and, and so she's been great. So anyway, I say all of that because for us, the, um, we learned that bad attitudes will ruin your team. The great Terry Bradshaw. We have Pittsburgh people. Yeah, there you go. So um, it, for us, all became about the team of people that we were working with. And by the way, I got plenty of people in my day job that I don't like. So why would I build a team with something that is bleeding cash, by the way, and, and spend all this time with them and, and not like them? So we built this group of folks that... Um, yes, we spent a lot of time, energy, and money on them, but I think even though they, they get at each other, they respect each other, um, you know, we've got two very uh, knowledgeable guys that went to school for this and, and, and a guy that didn't, and they, they most of the time respect each other um, for, for what uh, Derek knows about the farm just because he's been there longer than anybody, um, and so they, they listen to each other and they communicate. So no different than in your house, right? I mean, if you don't listen and communicate, it's not going to work. So I think just knowing uh, what, what your team is all about is super important. Um, how are we doing? We're trying to stop. Three minutes, perfect. Um, and and um, I think for me, Everything happens, I've noticed, in the Q&A when I do these things. I think it's most important that we just ask questions. And the nice thing is you can ask us. And um, I would just like to encourage everybody here to be more transparent. I think my little observations from two years is just that we get these little, you know, guarded turf wars and we worry about who's doing what and who's not doing what and who's good at what, like it, it will all play out. You'll, you'll do hopefully what you love and you'll, you'll do it 100% and you'll be good at it and it will, it will work itself out. I mean, um, so I, I just would encourage everybody to share with each other. I, I sell software um, and have for a long time and spent a lot of time at conferences and um, if, if you don't go up and talk to somebody and start asking them questions and learn from them, you don't really get much out of, you know, you can read all of our slides and, 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 and you have Google. So um, I, would, I, would, I would talk to people and, and get them and share what you're doing. So I think in our Q&A after lunch, I'll just open it up to what we're, you know, what we're doing, what we're focused on uh, and, and questions for us. I as well got into this because of nutrition and I'm, I'm sort of a, a health nut. My daughter had a severe allergy and we kind of went nuts into the whole food thing and just happened to be that that was when the whole food movement was happening. And so um, that is my passion and, and, and feeding people and, and having access to really, really good fish is what drove me here. So not, not knowing fish. I have people that know fish and by the way, their knowledge, they're new if you couldn't tell, super young. But they stop at some point when we run into a problem. And we have, on two occasions, reached out to a fish veterinarian. And it was a lifesaver. And it was something that we've, it was fairly simple. It was um, salt. <laughs> Spent a few hundred bucks. He drove down from wherever. And he, he looked at everything and was like, you need salt now. You need lots of salt. And that was great because I was, and we were all sort of pushing for, don't tell us we have to spray some sort of chemical in there because that goes against everything we're trying to, to do. Um, so that's great. Thank you for sharing that. And um, you know, that, that's a resource. That's a, that's a huge resource because knowing those people and having them, especially in that you know, time sensitive world that we live in, uh, being able to pick up the phone and call somebody and say, you know, what should I do is, is huge. Um, I've probably gotten past my three minutes. So um, anyway, um, we've got a few more fillets if, if anybody um, once one, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll give them out, but, um, and also we'll do a, a Q&A after lunch, and I'll talk a little bit more about what we're doing and how we're doing it. So, cool. Yep. Where were we? Okay, so we were talking about how important the team is, and we've invested heavily in our team, and I love our team, and um, they're great. Um, I also wanted to share, like, you know, we all come to this conference, and I feel like a lot of times what happens is we talk about all the opportunities and how you know how you know we're, we're all all the fish consumption is going up that's why I love this thing and 
it's like all the fish consumption is going up and you know supplies in the oceans and, and the rivers and the lakes are going down but yet people are eating more seafood and fish in particular and there's this huge white space in aquaculture but we we kind of tend to sit in here and talk about all the things that are like negative and not working and we just kind of like we beat each other up about you know the DNR this you know the government didn't pass this legislation and those are all difficult things that we all need to work through but um, my mom I don't know I, I might have mom issues I just put that up there <laughs> because like we blame something right like we, we, we all look to blame and, and and we're always blaming something but it's like you know I think back to some of the stories we heard about this is why you guys are getting in this you know for whatever you said your passion was like stick to that and stick to stick to what it is that that you know you want to do and yes we're trying a little bit of everything but we're slowly learning that we're not good at good at everything or we don't want to do everything um, so we we pursued an avenue uh, which which ultimately we should all be doing which is getting the highest price you can get for your whatever you're selling whatever your product is or whatever your fish is I mean what's funny um, you know a lot of, I get a lot of flack for being not in the state of Wisconsin and uh, a remote owner and operator and all of that but I think again those are negatives and what I'm not good at and I can't control some of those things right now but I think what I do bring to the table is a perspective not in Wisconsin you know I'm, I'm down little south and I'm in different regions I travel for work I'm in different cities like every week for for my day job and like you guys have the water resources here that people here I truly think take for granted um, you know I have friends I, I told this story not this is a completely true story when I first was telling a friend of mine who lives in California who happens to have a lot of resources uh, I told him about the land the fish and the water and he said can you drink the water I said oh yeah you can drink the water they they drink the water I said um, he said like how good is it And I said well we we sent it off to the lab and um, we're waiting to hear back because another side story my 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 buddy from home married a girl whose brother just retired as the CEO of Fiji water so I I said can I get his number because I think he probably knows a little bit about water and I think we have good water so I called him and he was hard to get a hold of but he finally called me back and after his sister said hey jerk call this guy back and uh, he said all right send me your lab results for your water I, P I sent him the PDF of our lab results he, he called me like right back which was kind of weird and he said you've got a rocket ship and I was like well, what does that mean he's like this water tests out better than Fiji and by the way it doesn't come from Fiji it comes from LA but uh, he said now if you just have 25 million dollars you could build a water bottling brand because you know it's a marketing game and and I said okay well I don't have 25 million dollars and um, but I but I, it ke it, I kept thinking my whole point of this is we have these fish in this region in this premium water and and the stigma around fish farming is that you know it's net pens and it's you know dirty and you know people that don't know anything but they know I only eat wild caught because it's you know it's sitting in a pen and all the reasons that you know you got to dump the chemicals and everything you guys are doing it the right way in the best water with good feed and you have the best product and yet we're not getting the price that we should be getting for that fish and I keep going back to value you know just not having access to this fish where I'm from as soon as I started with our our you know our little promotion direct to consumer which is what this whole talk was supposed to be about I'll get there um, was okay how do you get to that consumer so we I took a list of family and friends and pushed out you know a promo for them to buy our fish and the real question was are they going to buy it again at full price and are they going to keep buying it well it's a small test and you know Rachel has been figuring her way through all of the packaging and you know how much dry ice and how much this and how much that and how long can it last and all that and so we've been sending it out and people are buying it again and nobody once has asked me about the price and by the way it's nineteen dollars and ninety nine cents per pound for frozen rainbow trout on our website which seems astronomical although when you package it and you have Rachel who's you know expensive and takes time and no um, it, it it's not this 
massive home run, but you're, you're driving the price of, for the value of that fish, you know, for what you're getting. And so um, then I said, okay, well, we're not like a huge marketing engine. We've got 170 followers on Instagram, which is nothing to write home about. We just have started this whole social media game. Um, but you need to get your product to either the distributor, like the fish guys, I guess, who are doing a nice job and pushing higher prices for you know premium quality stuff. You need to get it to the individual that's going to get it to the consumer. If you're not going to be a marketer, and I saw like three hands of people who actually want to spend all their time on Instagram and Facebook and Snapchat and whatever that platform becomes five years from now, because those are changing every six months. It doesn't really matter. It just matters that you're good at it and you have content that people want to consume. You can't just do it. You have to do it every day, like I think I heard someone say, which is true. It only lasts for a little short blip in the universe, and then you have to be putting out content. But you also have to be really good at it, because there's so much noise and so much going out on those platforms that it has to be consumable, right? And so either you're going to be that entity, or you need to find the person doing that to get away from the five middlemen that are taking all of your profit. Because those five middlemen don't need to exist, right? I mean, the, the internet is the middleman now. I mean, so, so a quick story of, of how we did that and, you know, um, and, and how we think we're going to put effort into that. And by the way, if that doesn't work, we're going to adjust and shift and do something different. But right now, we've seen su success in this, in this approach. Um, because I think, like, I was talking to Abby, and Abby is on uh, Musical.ly. Sorry, Abby, I'm calling you out here. But who knows what Musical.ly is? Oh, we got one, two. Okay, why? Because your kid's on it? Yep. Okay, for any of you that, that two, you know, all of you except the two of you that know, three of you that know what Musical.ly is, and maybe Chris is going to be like, what's Musical.ly? You, you know. um, Musical.ly is a social media platform, and kids, uh, get on it and they record themselves uh, lip syncing over a track, usually some rap, you know, hot beat that is out there and they will lip sync the song and then they'll post it and they'll get likes. And you're like, why? I mean, my, my, nie <laughs> my, my niece spends, I mean, she, and, and, and there's, Abby, correct me if I'm wrong, there's certain little things they do where they do the heart and they do the thing and, and the, it's a certain way of looking on musically. Well, if you are trying to sell something to somebody between the ages of 8 and 14 and you don't know what musically is and you're not on that platform becoming a practitioner of that platform and pushing content out, you're going to die. Like you are just going to die. Here's a here's a something else you can who, who knows who knows who Emily and Evelyn are. Um, really? Oh my god, it's so funny. On YouTube Okay, Emily and Evelyn are two sisters, what, four and seven? My seven-year-old binge watches Emily and Evelyn. Do you know what these girls do? Their parents, I think it's their parents, stand there and videotape them opening toys. And Emily and Evelyn pass the toy back and forth and they talk about the toy and they share what they like about the toy. And guess what my seven-year-old does? Turns around and says, I want that toy. And so, I have to buy that toy or she's not going to be happy, you know. So, and, and everybody says, why are they doing that? Well, Emily and Evelyn made like $450,000 last year from Mattel and, and, you know, Toys R Us. You know, this is how things are getting sold, whether we like it or not, and it's not going away. It's, just, it's not. And, and if you're going to resist it or you're not going to get your product somehow to a place that's doing that, you're going to die. You just, you don't want to hear that. And... Social media is for your kids and blah, blah, blah. But, and you don't have to become the social media expert, but if your product isn't getting out there. So um, anyway, just a little bit about, so you know, we've seen all of these. And, and I'm not married to any sort of particular platform. I could care less what it is that's currently being used, because everybody said, oh, well, uh, um, you know, Snapchat's going to die because Instagram's doing everything. And so what did Snapchat do? They adjusted and they adapted and they're taking on all the things that our Instagram are doing. And now Snapchat use as the first thing out of her mouth was Snapchat. 
My, yeah, MySpace. <laughs> Right, MySpace. Who cares? Is, you know, Snapchat may be dead in six months or 18 months. I don't think so personally. But again, if that's the demographic that you're selling X, Y, and Z to, and you're not, it's not on there somehow. Not happening. So, what can we do about it? You can, you know, it doesn't take a, a, a you know, a videographer or a photographer or any anybody to start putting out content. I mean, if you start putting out content and even posting it or following places that are in the same, where, where that consumer exists, then you will eventually create a dialogue. Just to give you an example, we're tiny, 174 followers on Instagram, it's nothing, right? So how are we having success? Because just to give you a perspective, um, some of the food bloggers that we have decided to approach on Instagram um, have an average between 40 and 80,000. And by the way, that's just on the cusp of becoming sort of cool or popular. It's, you know, and, and that was sort of, I read an article where, you know, anybody under 80,000 followers, you should start, if you have a product, you should start trying to interact with them or getting in, into their feed somehow. Um, and, and, and because they're, got, they're about to blow up, they're about to go 100, 150, you know, uh, 200,000 followers, and then all of a sudden, perfect example, a woman that is in our neighborhood started a blog called My Life and Kids, and I didn't even really know what a blog was when she was doing it. I knew she liked to write. She's not up. She doesn't like to be on the camera. She doesn't like to take pictures, but she likes to write. So she just started writing about what she knew, which was her life and her kids, and fast forward, she was in the right place at the right time, and now a stay-at-home mom gets phone calls once a week, and we happen to be in the land of Procter and Gamble and you know you know or Pampers will call her and say hey can you we got a new Pamper coming out can you write about it and here's 30 grand 30 grand 30 grand 30 grand 30 grand every week 30 grand I, products are just like approaching her because the shift in marketing has now become put up a billboard or you know used to be put up a you know a, a magazine and, and hope that that article gets read or whatever or you can go directly to the moms 35 to 45 that like uh, uh, pink slippers because you're able to identify that through their social media and you can market your pink slippers directly to them and what's that conversion rate look like. It's, it's, not, it's not if it's happening, it's happening. So I'll get off my pedestal about social media but I would argue that if we don't as an industry start taking this premium product and somehow getting it to an entity that has a focus on this, because I don't think any of us are probably going to magically start to have 500,000 followers on a social media platform, then I think, I think we're making a huge mistake. So um, what have we done in our little world um, to try to, to go after that? Um, sustainable small fisheries. Now, the wild caught guys are doing well with this because there are a couple groups that have, you know, um, started taking small wild caught fisheries, are going right to the docks, are going right to the boat, and they're getting that fish. Um, who's familiar with sea to table? Have you ever heard of sea to table? Anybody? Sea to table. So I happen to have a friend who's who's who works at a restaurant, and that's how they get all their fish. They they have a list of you know a couple thousand chefs, and they go all over the coasts, and they they'll just say, hey, we got 300 pounds of red snapper today, and wherever we are and they'll post a picture of it and they'll blast it out to their chefs and the chefs can order it directly from sea to table. And so that sort of, I call it the blue apron bucket where you know people are wanting stuff immediately shipped to them fresh, you know, they're willing to pay for it. It's just that market is getting bigger and bigger and I think that we should be taking advantage of it because we have a product um, that is that is a premium product. It's a, it's a fantastic product and it's not, in, and it's desirable by people outside of, where are we, Marshfield. I mean, <laughs> outside of Wisconsin, I mean, it, it is. And you know, you can get into the carbon footprint argument and the shipping of all this stuff, but the reality is um, the folks that we're shipping our fish to, and it's not a lot, we're just testing this to see if we're good at it, um, but they're buying it again and their kids like it, and their kids never ate fish, and they can't figure out why they like this fish. Well, it tastes good. And what's the magic? Well, first of all, it's fresh. Second of all, it's in phenomenal water, and we buy a good feed, and we, we don't overstock, and all of these things that a lot of you are doing. So uh, that mom who just, her, her goal is to get fish into the dinner, 
menu on, at home and she wants it and she wants it conveniently and she doesn't want to have to think about it and and this is a company that's um, making it easy. Not really for the mom, but this is a company called Love the Wild. Has anybody heard of Love the Wild? If you were at the aquaculture, uh, global aquaculture conference, um, I, I, I just scrolled through who was presenting and I just found it fascinating that at the aquaculture, and I don't know, maybe the aquaculture conference is just for the science and the, you know, the industry to do better at growing and, and, and the fish, but we have to sell the fish. Um, so she presented. Um, I met uh, Jacqueline and Claudia at the, on, on, a, on a whim, I went to the, the Seafood Expo in Boston and I stayed in the equivalent of like a youth hostel because all of a sudden when you're traveling on your own dime, you know, you, you're really frugal um, as opposed to traveling for the company. So I went there, um, saw her presentation on, on farm raised fish um, and why she thought it was important to source really good small companies that are doing it the right way and why there's a demand for it. And you know, you had all these seafood guys kind of laughing at her. First of all, she was a woman in a very male dominated arena and she was young and she was talking about farm fish and these guys who were all looked like sailors. I mean, they were, you know, looked right, right off the Gordon fish box. And, and, and I approached her and just said hello and that we have a rainbow trout farm and and Wisconsin, and she said, oh, that's really interesting, you know, here's my card, get a hold of me, the old traditional whatever. And so um, I said, okay, so I called her and I emailed her and, you know, whatever, and then I just started following her on Instagram. I saw they were putting out some pretty cool content, and it really wasn't about buying their fish. It happened to be photos of in the wild, like cool photos of outdoor activities that I happened to enjoy, and so I was consuming something that I really liked but also because of a brand that I thought was cool and I wanted to sell my fish to. Um, I had no idea what she was willing to pay. Um, so anyway, fast forward, Instagram, I learned about this thing called DM. Who knows what direct messaging is in Instagram? It's how you, if you follow somebody, you follow them back and, they, and then you can message them um, privately. Um, so it all goes down in the DM, if you've ever heard that. Like stuff happens in there and it's, and it's not just, you know, uh, stuff that, you know, social stuff. It's business to business, it's business to consumer, it's, it's happening in a big way. And uh, um, she got back to me. She hadn't returned a phone call, she hadn't, but she, she monitors her social media platform because she thinks it's really important. Um, and she said, you know, it's funny you're sending me this note. Um, she said, we would love to check out your farm and see if you're actually doing what you said you were doing and how you're doing it because that's, um, she said, we're all about transparency and traceability. So her whole thing is US-based fish farms, traceable. And, and I said, okay. So I said, but there's no way, because we realize that we really can't sell our fish to a distributor, which is sort of how I thought of her. Um, but she's breaking that whole model. She's taking a filet in a piece of parchment paper, which is what that is, cut in a heart, get it? Love the wild, you fold that over and it, fits the filet, and then she adds her three sauces to it that are frozen, and that's all that, that you see on that tray is in one box. So the millennial walks into the, you know, the high-end grocery store and wants dinner, wants to know where it came from, wants it to taste good, and wants it to be easy. And she can go in and grab that one box, and it's, I don't know, it's like a six to seven ounce filet, right? We know that really well. Um, <laughs> we'll talk about that in a minute. but. They can go in and grab that, and it's, now it's a meal. It's not, a, it's not by the pound. They're not buying it by the pound, but do the math on this. Nine to $11, depending on the store, for a meal seems high, but you know, once I get my rice and my veggies and it was easy and I'm home and I have a really good piece of fish and it, was, and it has the sauce and I don't have to think about it. By the way, this goes straight, directly from the freezer into the oven for 20 minutes and it's done, which I didn't even know that you can cook fish that way. That changed my whole perspective on things because I have four kids and planning meals is tough and if we forget, I can pull fish out, put it in the oven and it's done in 20 minutes and it's great. Um, so she's on to something and if you do the math, it's between 27 and $32 a pound for a piece of frozen fish from your farm. Now, is she seeing that? No. Am I seeing that? No. Um, Whole Foods is seeing that but they got it so high that she can now afford to pay me $9 a pound, wholesale essentially. Um, 
So we went through the rigmarole. She looked at how we were doing everything, and, and we finally came to terms on that, plus shipping and, you know, can we do it, and talk to these guys, and Derek said no, everybody else said yes, and so <laughs> we outvoted him, we outvoted him and, and, and now Derek has, you know, what I think is a pretty well-oiled machine of getting these, because by the way, that box doesn't change size, uh, and fish vary in size, so um, anyway, that, that, that's sort of the story of how did somebody with no following and no social, because you may say, oh, I don't have anybody, or, or I have 500 followers, which is great, um, or I have, I'm Urban Organics, I have 40,000 followers. If you're not converting those 40,000 followers, what's, it, what's the point? Um, but anyway, um, I've been consuming Urban Organics posts for a long time, and I just, I like, I like aquaponics, and I, you know, I enjoy looking at it. It has to, has to give you value. You can't just push something down somebody's throat. So that's, that's our story about that one. And this is one startup you know, that, that is a, a, a really sharp woman out of Boulder, Colorado, who was tired of her cubicle and wanted to, she was into fish and, and figured out a model that um, we hope works. I mean, we're in, we're in the infancy of it. And you know, we're, um, you know, we're, we're, we're shipping a pallet to her um, it's, it's now in uh, Target, which is pretty cool. Target's getting in the fish game, uh, the high-end fish game, and and the, and, and so uh, you know that that's that's just it. My, the point of that whole story is: Are we riding off into the sunset and rolling in in dough? No, we're losing our ass right now between you know <laughs> between time and effort. And but this is a long game, right? This is a how do we change the industry? How do we use these social media platforms? How do we um, get get the story out there because by the way I got an email from Jacqueline Claudia the founder just on Monday which she doesn't email little peons like me like she's she's put it this way she pitched her idea to a VC firm to get her funding and they passed this is a good story they passed and they said you know one of the people that invests in our venture capital firm um, is really into this whole save the ocean stuff so you might want to talk to him his name's leonardo dicaprio and she was like oh okay you know so they, they these these people set it up and she's like oh i'm gonna go meet this guy i'm gonna meet his people i'm sure and and she had to go out to la and she goes into this conference room and sure as shit leonardo's there with his feet up on the table and he's like tell me why that why i give why i give a crap about you know fish farming <laughs> you know and she sort of lost it and composed herself, and then she, she must have done a great job because he realized that you know he could invest in this company, and he, he was more about the mission of saving the ocean and saving it from illegal farming and you know raping the floor of the ocean and all, all of that stuff and, and, and all the things that you know we read about. Um, but he, he was he was invested in that you know emotionally, so um, he bought into her. So um, you know I, I, I just think. If we sit here and we think that those platforms are for our kids and it's just for wasting time on the phone, you're kidding yourself. You're absolutely kidding yourself. And I don't care if you're um, Bob trying to sell aerators to you know somebody saving the whales. He told the story about you know he said you know I don't know why we were going out to save the whales, but you know and we got we got 1,500 likes from people that probably aren't crazy about the fact that we're in the fish farming business. But guess what? He just got exposure to people that he thought hated him. So that worked. I mean, it, and, and that, is, that, that happens all day, every day, and it's not going away. So um, even if you think it's a futile effort, I would encourage you to be taking pictures of your operation, to be posting it to you know, anything that you think makes sense and, and putting it out there. And I, I would love to be able to follow fellow people and tell that story and get it to her and have her push it out and all of a sudden we have a voice on a really large scale of this product that then we're not in these turf wars right where we're thinking there's like just a few customers in the in the tri-state and we have to you know uh, tri-state that's from being ohio kentucky indiana i don't know what you call it but in the region uh you know and we, we, we can't share anything with anybody there's a there's a, a growing population that's kind of starting with abby's age and going up from there that is aware of what's going on and the food and the health and the traceability and where is my food coming from and if you're not in that conversation I think we die no, no question I think we die so um, that's my rant on that um, this is a quote I like who, who knows who Gary V is Gary Vaynerchuk he's uh, you should you should you should look him up he's a uh, 
he's a great story and, and he's sort of the guru in this space and you know, you'll, re you'll listen to his, his YouTube stuff and say, oh, that's where he was ripping off those concepts from. But he, this is a proven you know, um, a guy who grew up from nothing, literally nothing, um, and, and he has a lot of inspirational videos he puts out. He puts out content, content, content all the time. He's always recording what he's doing, um, and, he's, and he's really exposed me to what is happening in the social media world and that you have to be involved. I don't care if you're selling baseball hats or farm fish, you, you gotta be doing it. Um, so this kind of comes full circle to, you know, think about, um, you, you know, I love what he says, and I've heard this before, you know, oh, the, the social media game is for the millennials or the kids or the people that are on it all the time that grew up. Guess what you have that they don't have, most of you? Experience. Life experience, you, you know what life is all about. I mean, you can tell a story and you live through stuff. Those are more valuable than, you know, somebody just starting an Instagram account and calling themselves an entrepreneur and, you know, not having any experience doing anything. So um, I, think, I think there's, you know, you're, you're undervaluing your life's experience. We just heard a few stories um, on that note. So, so it's funny you bring that up about, you know, your mission. So, so that's your passion. So that's like what you want to do. Um, that's, you, you're, you're way far ahead of a lot of people who just say, I want to become a business owner or start something because I want to, you know, make a lot of money and, you know, be cool on Instagram. So you have, you have something that you're really passionate about. And I just had this conversation with my wife because I wanted to, you know, I got on this social media kick or whatever, and I wanted to, to have my daughter get involved in what she's doing now, which is every time we eat a, a smoked piece of fish, she freezes the skin and then uh, she um, puts it in a big bag and then she takes our dehydrator and she dehydrates it and she sells it to the, um, the guy who has a high-end like, dog food business and you know these, these things go for like four bucks for a skin twisted up and dehydrated. So she's starting her own lemonade stand off of you know the back of these fish that we're eating, which I thought was cool. She kind of came up with it because she went to the farmer's market with me and talked to the guy who had the stand and started following him. And I said, well, you know, you should start videotaping what you're doing and just, just even if it's just to document it, like, you know, just get the phone out and start. And my wife like went nuts. I mean, she was like, why are you getting her on like social media and putting her out on the internet and that's weird and creepy and disgusting and and I was like look she can either because it's happening like right I'm not gonna like n she's not gonna not have a phone like what do you know so I can either have her do something productive with her time and build like a business or you know like get involved in our little business and you know uh, not be because when her friends come over they want to play video games or they want to get you know spend a lot of time on sorry Abby musically or Emily and Evelyn I'm like well they're gonna get they're gonna consume it it's no different what what did our parents tell us scoot back from the TV too close to the TV TV's gonna ruin your eyes well did we all throw our TVs out no we just you know so I would rather her focus her efforts on something that is related to God forbid, making a buck or, you know, learning something or, you know, paying some of her own way for crying out loud, something that, you know, earning her keep or whatever. I mean, and, and then my wife's like, well, what? That just builds this false sense of self-esteem and they get these likes and, the, and then that's weird. And, and I said, what did you do in third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth grade? Like when you were in the little club or you tried to get the guest jeans or what were you trying to do? You were trying to get likes. Like this is, ha like, this is no different than we always have been doing. It's just gone digital. So don't, you know, don't fight it, but redirect it. So I didn't mean to go off on a tangent, but that is, that's a great example of yes, get them off of the BS or the rabbit hole they shouldn't be going down or the exposure to you know, whatever you don't want them exposed to because there's, you know, so many terrible things on the internet, but um, redirect that, that energy. So that's really cool. So you have a passion for that. And I've seen that, you know, I don't know much about aquaponics business models. I know we've, we've heard from some folks that have gotten huge partners involved and they've got a lot of exposure and they're generating income. But, you know, there's, I think there's, I think there's room in that space for the whole point, which is small and local and educational, I think I think there's money to be made in a business there. I don't I don't I don't pretend to know how that works, but it just feels like that is you know a good way to go because you know having a massive system where now you have to distribute food everywhere, 
long distances seems kind of counterintuitive, but um, that's cool. That's very cool. Sorry about the t-shirt, but um, it's a t-shirt. Um, okay, so that's, that's, I think, enough of me uh, ranting about, um, about things. So Q&A, how are we? Uh, three, oh, perfect. Three minutes. So um, any questions for our folks or me or um, what else we're doing? Yes? You talk about, oh, sorry. Oh, it's okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. In the formation of your team, yeah. and, and did it form naturally? Does someone have the idea, and then does the team have the equal investment risk taking? Are they taking the profits? How's, how's that? Good question. So um, our folks right now are, yeah, they love that question because, you know, <laughs> Scott's like, hey, man, you're not paying me much, but at some point I want some skin in the game, you know, if I'm going to stick around. So, um yeah, so, so no, we, we, right now, we have what I think are the highest wages we can afford to pay for the talent we've paid, and we've sold ourselves as a story and, a, and an environment and a, and a, you know, a place where everybody's um, decision matters and we listen to each other. I think, I, I, I do think it kind of formed, uh, we were forced into it because we brought, originally brought in people that didn't have the same mindset that we had. Um, and so we were all miserable, and it was yeah. I, I guess what I'm My wife and I, uh, you know, we, we we've saved a little bit of money, and we also have a couple rental properties that generate a little income. We're not rich, um, so we don't have unlimited resources. So we found uh, originally our passion, my passion, was, and and her passion was, you know, food and nutrition. And then I found this farm, and it kind of fit in, you know, everything that I wanted to do. But then we found another farm, and then I realized that was outside of our means, and we wanted to actually make a business, and then we wanted to spend money on people. So, um, yes, I have a very formal operating agreement that went through an ungodly number of renditions because, you know, um, they're all like close friends of mine, and I don't want them to not be friends. So I, 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 want, I wanted to have worst case scenarios all laid out. Um, if this thing completely craps the bed, then what does that look like? I mean, who, you know, how, do we have assets that we can sell to reimburse people? And essentially, you know, the, the folks that I got involved, you know, put up some money, but it was, it was more um, enough, I think I was telling somebody earlier this, it was, it was enough money for them financially that if that all went away, we'd still be friends. It wasn't, it wasn't, I'm going all in and my wife's gonna hate you and, you know, we're gonna never talk and, you know, it would be painful and, and all of those things, and I'd be embarrassed and disappointed and whatever. But in the end, it was this amount of money that they would not be hurting if it completely went away, and it was a lot of upside. So for them, I'm doing all the work. They're, they're, all of my partners are just cash and advice and mentors and that sort of thing. So um, I hope that answers your question. But yeah, our, our agreement, we have an operating agreement. Um, we have an LLC. We, we, it went through an incredible number of, you know, what ifs, and then, you know, um, I think Dr. John, is that okay to call you Dr. John? Uh, had, a, like, his, the content in, the content in his, uh, like, I, I'll say it again, I always was like, oh, we have the PhDs and people at this conference that know the science of it, but these guys dropped some incredible knowledge on fundamentals of what to consider um, when starting your business financially. So that, I think, has always been missing a little bit from these things that I've been to. So I, I, would, I would really follow those principles. I mean, a business plan, um, when we went for our, our um, we have a USDA loan, um, we, had to, um, we had to supply a lot of um, business plan and information and how are we going to do things to them. So all of that, yeah, I mean, you're treating this as a business. And if it's family, it's even more important. Because I can tell you three stories right now that I won't about friends who got into the family business and the dad started it and the, um, the son grew it from 300,000 a year to 60 million a year and they never wrote anything down. And dad never stepped foot in the piece of business that son took over uh, when, when it was sort of a, I'll tell you the business, it was a call center business and dad's business was a consulting business and a sports agency that lost money every year. And in the basement they had four or five, you know, cubicles and the son graduated from college and he said, Dad, what's that all about? And he said, oh, that's a call center business, it doesn't make any money. Uh, he said, I think I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot. Um, so he went down there and 
built relationships with the people and then sold contracts to American Express and Discover and you know built it to a $60 million business. And just three months ago, um, dad called a meeting with son and dad brought mom and dad brought dad's attorney. And dad and son are really close, by the way. This is not a strained relationship. And he sat down and uh, he said, hey, I just want you to know, you know, mom and I aren't gonna be around forever. Um, you know, uh, you know when, when we die, we've worked this out, like your brother and sister and you, brother and sister have not even interned in this business, more or less set foot in there, nothing. And he said, when we die, it's gonna go a third, a third, a third. And he's like, what's gonna go a third, a third, a third? Mind you, this guy has an airplane now, and he flies all over the, I mean, he's grew this into a massive business, and they never wrote anything down, there was no agreement, there was nothing in place. It's dad's business. It's a problem. It's a problem. It's a very strained relationship, as you can imagine now. So, yes, I would say, I don't care if you're going to do aquaponics in your basement, and you're going to, you know, feed your neighbors, maybe even more important to have an agreement, because those are people you're, you know, you're close with, so. You guys better save the claps to later if you really do get something out of this. So it's my wife's birthday. I haven't been home in two weeks. That's why I try to flip it up to go first. Apologize, but um, I value my, my marriage. So having said that, is there anybody in here that's not a Packer fan? I just want uh, to tell your relative where I come from. So. Born and raised in Pittsburgh. Okay. And someone else raised their hand? Who are you, who's, who are you cheering for? Minnesota. So Oklahoma. you guys over there, I'll do this later when I'll talk a lot slower. Okay. <laughs> and for the Minnesota fan, if you look at those trophies, those are Lombardi trophies. You get them when you win the Super Bowl. Hey, they had one, <laughs> they had one this year. You, not, you don't get them for participation. I'm just saying. Okay. All right, now we got that over with. An alternate title could be what the hell have I learned the past last 30 plus years within this industry as it relates to convincing people to buy stuff we offer so we can all make money. So, uh, what qualifies me to give this? I'm the guy on the, on the way left. But 30 years within the industry, I've been on at least 1,500 farms throughout the world. I'm a former director of sales and marketing for Perina Ring and Feeds in the Eastern United States, and I'm current director of sales and marketing for Casco Marine located in Prescott, Wisconsin. So that itself doesn't mean anything, but I've made a lot of mistakes, and I've learned from those mistakes, and I've been on a lot of farms. You know, so managing expectations as it relates to your farms. I'm going to give you a real life example. Last week, and I was at Aquaculture America. I came home on Thursday, and the um, flight got stuck in Minneapolis, it's four hours late, so I'm supposed to go up to the American Birkenbinder and ski the race that day, or it's starting the next morning, and I decided to go up the next morning. Well, uh, eight inches of snow later, I arrived in time to wait 45 minutes at a bus that carried me to the start line, and I didn't have my bib yet, and so I'm running around to get my bib, I got to the start gate, and the gun went off. Now about halfway through the race thinking, well, I, I was going to try to finish first in my age group. And I managed my expectations, just said, you know, it's a pretty day, it's a good race, I'm just going to calm down and, and let it be. So what did I learn? You know, just plan better for the future. You know, you don't you know, take a flight like a day before you're going to do a race, and that could be translated into business as well. I didn't finish first, I didn't finish last, and I had, and I had a good time. So, 15.5, does anybody know what that number is? That number is the per capita consumption of sea fish in the United States, seafood. And it's been stuck there for a long time. In fact, it was a little bit higher than that um, uh, not too long ago. And our job is to change that number, is to make it go up. So 15.5 pounds of fish are annually consumed, or seafood are annually consumed by US consumers. And beef is a lot more than that. You know, so marketing or sleuthing for sales, that's what this is all about. <clears throat> Sometimes the lines between sales and marketing are vague, and so I like to define them both. Marketing is activities identifying customers' needs, product and service development, advertising and generate interest in what you have to offer or sell. Sales is the activity focused on converting prospects to actual paying customers or convincing people to buy. The management process through which goods and services move from concept to customers using the four P's. 
product, price, place, and promotional strategy. Put a little effort into, market, put a little effort into marketing or customer's research. This saves you from wasting time talking to people that only want the cheapest deal. And we're not here for the cheapest deal. We're here for the best deal. Then there's a difference. Value. So uh, the governor was on um, Star Prairie Trout Farm this um, early summer, and he signed a bill. That's a fantastic thing. I snapped a picture. I just happened to focus with our aerator in the background, and we use it in an ad right now. So <laughs> <laughs> selling, what a broad topic. Sales is more science than art. 70% of the buying experience takes place prior to the sale. We were all selling something. Like for me, the permission was for me to, to sell to my wife that I could come here on her birthday. You know, she, she got it as long as I'm home so we can celebrate this afternoon. Improve yourself, which is the first step to improving relationships. Move out of your comfort zone, commit to success. Marketing yourself, your company, to your company and your employees. So. Marketing is a noun, the action of bus or business of promoting and selling products or services, including market research and advertising. Verb, advertise and promote. This is what people want today. Locally grown, sustainable, which I have a hard time defining at times. Carbon footprint, I hear it all the time, carbon footprint. Organic, they want to hear organic, they want to hear fresh, they want to hear healthy over and over and over again. This is what the new generation wants to hear and this is what they want in the products that they buy. What do customers want? Words that attract. So what words attract people to buy things to, to manage the expectations of the previous slide? Pure, artesian, wholesome, locally grown, fresh, healthy, honest. Honest is, is an experience. It's you don't mislabel. You tell people the truth. I challenge every waitress that I go to in a restaurant, where did this fish come from? You know, if they tell me, you know, the wild cherry snapper was a farm-raised fish, uh, I'm gonna know that that's not the truth. The reverse is that a lot of times salmon is a confusing topic. If you go to the Pacific Northwest and they think that you want the answer to be wild because they're anti-farmed in the northwestern United States for many reasons, and I can get into those later. And when they say the wrong answer, I challenge to get in and talk to the chef because that's where the information is coming from. The chef tells the people what to sell in the background, and they tell the story to tell the servers. And so I challenge you to go into a restaurant that has a product that you know is farm-raised and tell them the advantages of it because that's the start of the story. That's where people get misinformation. They need to be telling the truth. So, tell them a story. There was a whole session in the World Art Culture meeting last, last week on telling your story. People want the story. The story is what sells stuff. You know, storytelling, every company has a story. Truth, employing local growers, workers, Branding is your story. Websites are okay. They're not what they used to be. Social media, conversation, advertising, marketing get the biggest results. Do not bash your competition. So I don't want you to go bashing wild fish, even though we have ammunition until we can do that. But fish as a whole is a good product because omega-3 amino acid. And so we just have to support the industry as a whole. We don't bash other people. But you can brand it with local and produce in the USA, which is good stuff. You know, people have a, mis or they have a perceived negative connotation with imported product. Some of it's good, some of it's bad, some of it you don't know about. And so that's to everyone's advantage in the room here that if we buy it in the United States, we are playing by different rules that other countries don't necessarily play by. Why U.S. farm raised continued? His, it has a consistent supply, healthy omega-3 amino acids. Fish farmers by necessity are good environmental stewards and if they weren't, they would be out of business because they're polluting the water that the fish have to grow in. Uh, when is the last time you walked into a restaurant and asked for a wild pig or a wild cow or a wild chicken, you know? You know, this wild fish stuff has got to go. Farmers are not strong enough to defend themselves against the larger special interest groups. There are so many people out there that 
are going after farmers for all of the wrong reasons. <clears throat> you know, why U.S. farm raised uh, uh, continued? There's over 1.2 billion in FarmGate at this point, so that employs a lot of people. Over oh, 7 billion to the U.S. economy, provides 250,000 jobs nationally. The trade step deficit is still over $10 billion to seafood. HACCP is just a measure of protection. Cool is country of original labeling. Contaminants free. You can't, you can't get products into the food chain without it being reviewed by the regulatory agencies. And it has a consistent flavor. Why farm? Wild fish populations are shrinking. The world demand for fish as protein is increasing because of population growth as well as healthy eating habits. Challenge chefs, as I talked about. Control what they eat. We can control what they eat. Farmers can. Take a look at this. This is a take home that you could go to chefs and restaurants about. If you look at developing countries around the world, whether it's China, Asia, some South American countries, fish is the major component of their diet. And why is that? It's because they convert feed to flesh better than any other protein source. And these numbers are not exaggerated. This is what's going on in the real world. Fish, some salmon farms are getting even less than you know, in parts of their growth cycle, but one pound of feed to one pound of growth. And that's phenomenal. You know, hogs are two to one, cows are five to six to one, chickens are two to four to one. And so it's not only that, it's not, I'm not bashing beef. I'm just saying that you, you, some of the beef that is being produced uses a lot of water to irrigate farm fields. And that isn't even entered into the equation in terms of consumptive use of a resource. Fish farmers are not consuming water. They're borrowing water. It exits the property and it goes somewhere else. And it's cleaned up before it leaves. So they're not a, consum they're not a consumptive user. They're a borrower of water. What are the objections to purchasing fish? I don't know how to prepare it. Well, we all learned last night how to prepare it, and you should use that as a tool. Last time I bought it, it was fishy. Well, that could be that it was hanging on the counter too long. And if it hangs on the counter too long, you can maybe prep it different, you know, put it into something else, put it into a stew to where that off flavor might go off or, or go away. And the other thing is that you can control the flavor of the fish by what you feed it. And if you feed it a, a, a normal diet consistent with a decent level of protein and uh, omega-3 or, or the proper balance of, of um, uh, acids and so forth, it's going to produce a fish that is consistent in flavor. Antibiotic usage. In the United States, the, there are four legal antibiotics that are used. And a farmer, the last thing that he wants to do is use an antibiotic because it's costly. And the last thing he wants to do is have these fish develop a genetic re resistance to it. And so antibiotic use is sparingly used within the industry. And if we look at the other industries that I had up before, they're using a heck of, they have a heck of a lot more that they can use. And you can, you can get by without using antibiotics. And uh, in fact, a lot of the recirculating systems don't use antibiotics and use that to your advantage. Genetic pollution. This one really ruffles my feathers. And I'm going to use the example. Has anyone know, heard of the cage that allowed fish to escape up in Washington state in the last um, uh, few months? So. The story of cook culture, the, the, the farm that bought the farm from somebody else, applied for a permit to redo this cage because they knew that it was in ill repair. Well, they weren't getting the permit. The regulatory agencies were dragging their feet. They dragged it for quite a while. And in the meantime, it broke, the fish got out. So the fish got out and the people that don't like the fish getting out started saying they're genetically polluting the wild. And so um, tribal, um, First Nation, I guess I have to call it, be politically correct, uh, First Nation efforts were to catch the fish. They, they caught the fish. They got paid a sum of money to catch the fish. Well, lo and behold, First Nation is one of the first people squeaking about the fish getting out because of their genetic pollution. 60% of the wild fish in that area came from a farm. 
they're stocked at this size. So they're not, it's not genetic pollution, it's the same genetic stream. So let's get over the genetic pollution uh, argument. Environmental degradation. There is a lot of time, money, and effort being spent into low phosphorus feeds. In fact, at the University of Idaho in Hagerman, Idaho, he's already got some low phosphorus and no phosphorus feeds that are performing as well as regular feeds. They're just slightly more in price, but phosphorus is the big deal. You need to keep phosphorus out of, phosphorus has been identified as one of the limiting nutrients for plant growth in aquatic systems. So if we can keep it out, uh, we won't have that issue. So there, there's quiescent zones, there's filtration, there's a lot of standards that are put in place to make sure that we are good environmental stewards. So I don't buy the environmental degradation part of this. So the foreign stuff, you know, cheap land, cheap labor, environmental degradation, use of therapeutics, uh, that's an advantage. And it, it, we can't, so how we can market against that is we don't have to necessarily say that, we're just going to say made locally, made in the United States, and I think that that in itself will be a marketing tool to your advantage. NIMBYs, which are not in my backyard people, they're going to come up with excuses because they just don't, don't want it. They don't use science, they just say, I don't want it there. And they, these are, in some cases, terrorists. They'll go rip things apart, they'll come after people with boats, uh, they've taken guns at people, and they're just not, I'm not saying all, because you know, I'm, I'm a member of environmental organizations, it's just that I prefer to act responsible and base my decisions based on science, not on emotion. Contaminants, we talked about that, wild versus farm. Uh, farm. Here's an example, my uh, daughter was in the uh, state uh, track championships in lacrosse probably 10 years ago. On the way home, we stopped by Subway and there's a little, they, they have a placard, it was during, uh, during Lent, I believe it was. The placard said, um, eat our, our, our farm-raised salmon, or uh, eat our wild-raised salmon special. Always wild, never farmed. And so my wife told me, calm down, Bob. That girl, <laughs> the girl at the counter doesn't know anything about that placard. So I just, I just, so I, all I said is, all I said to her, well, do you know that 60% of those fish came from a farm? And she said, no, I didn't know that. And I said, well, could you get me someone in your marketing department? And, um, well, obviously she didn't, but I got online, I sent three emails, they never responded to me, but I'm still eating at Subway, but I'm not eating their wild, uh, salmon. Don't take her there for your birthday. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no birthday with a wild salmon at, at uh, Subway. Alternative proteins from the wild. This gets over the fish in, fish out equation that people are, are saying that, um, well, you got to take menhaden, anchovies, and stuff like that to feed the fish to get the protein to. Get, so you're taking stuff out of the wild to make, so it's a negative balance. Well, so, soy is being done now with salmonids on a, on a pretty successful basis. Insects in other countries are very common. And, and, and get this, this slide here. This is just happening. So I have a nutritionist friend, one of the best nutritionists in the world. They're harvesting the silver carp and the big head carp from the Illinois River chain. They're producing fish meal, and they're now marketing it to people that are making fish feed. And on a side note, I challenge anyone in this room, write this down. Fish, carp hunters from Illinois. You'll get some pretty entertaining videos. Like this guy water skiing behind a boat with these guys coming out. Just, it's, it's, it's an interesting video, that's all I'm gonna say. I wouldn't do this at home, or I'm not advising you to do what these guys do. But, I'll back up one here. So, cost per unit gain with this protein is better than normal fish meal. And so I think there's big things here, unless they have such a demand that they harvest all the fish that are there, but they've got a long way to go. They're doing it by fight net right now, which is just putting a net out and having nets get trapped in there, and it's labor intensive. But with the cost of labor and all the production costs, the cost per unit gain, what that means is the cost of that feed produces a fish cheaper 
than uh, alternative protein sources. Okay, on to slogans and billboards, catchy phrases people remember. You know, Ticketmaster, I'm not saying do this, but just slogans. Yeah, we're going to charge you whatever we want. You know, I, I, how many times do you go to the end of the, the exchange of Ticketmaster and there's a $39, Friday, $39 Friday deal and uh, you've you got to pay because your last name is Robinson, that kind of stuff. Will these work? Today's special, buy one, fish, buy one fish and chips for the price of two and receive a second fish and chips absolutely free. <laughs> or Outback Steakhouse, fish of the day is beef. <laughs> Might be effective, but I'm not sure it would, I would use this. <laughs> but it got your attention. So, bumper stickers, these all have come from within the industry. Someone mentioned Herbie's Place, EatMyFish.com. I, you know, I've seen this in multiple states, driving around. Promote catfish, run over a chicken. Smoke trout, not crack, that's a slogan from a trout farm in Pennsylvania. Got trout from Star Prairie Trout Farm uh, over north of Minne northeast of Minneapolis. Recent survey concerning what your customers want within this industry is they want knowledge. Solving the issues or, or problems, helpful and friendly service, service or order accuracy, prompt response, price, new products or offerings. And it was in this order. So you see where price is. It's number five. This is the end user. I'm not talking about the wholesaler. The wholesaler sometimes wants to get the lowest price possible within reason. He will pay for locally grown to an extent. If it starts to get creep too much far above where he can get it other places, he might lean in that direction. So it's your job and your challenge to possibly scoot around the wholesaler in some cases if you can and, and sell direct. Our experience last year was painful buying a car. I'm, I'm only bringing this up because uh, you know we looked at every one of these vehicles and narrowed it to these vehicles and what influenced it? Was price, value, freshness, are we getting a good deal? You know, freshness was the, the, everything new there, all the, the anti-swerve, the, the cruise control stuff. Uh, once all of the before mentioned are answered, we are focusing on the deal. The deal incorporates all the marketing and sales points used to make the decision. What it boils down to is what is right for us. And I can tell you price was not the number one determining factor. And we bought what my, my wife wanted. It wasn't the car I wanted, but it's what the wife wanted. <laughs> so, so the message is, I'm sorry? Yeah. Each of you need to think about what is right for your customers and use that as a marketing advantage. As painful as a startup is, you need to start small. Understand that a good bit of your sales come from referrals which makes starting in the business very difficult. You don't have referrals if you don't have a company. You know, you've got to, I mean, they might have a referral that this is a good guy, but referrals sell everything. A business plan. If you need more money in three years after startup and you have not made any money, good luck going to a bank. So the message is you might want to borrow enough to keep you through five years or something like that, like that if you are borrowing money or if you're starting small, can use your profits to fund the future. Many times marketing your philosophy to your company is overlooked. You know, the key to your success is tied to keeping good people. In, in, you know, I, in, in my business, the key to success is hiring good people, treating them fairly, and paying them a fair wage. So if you hire good people, you're open with them, you pay them a fair wage, treat them the way you wish to be treated, listen to them and employ their recommendations. They want to all feel that, like they are part of the decision-making process. Entitle them, I mean, allow them to do the work. Um, if you not treat them fair in their minds, they could become your competition. A non-compete is only worth what you're willing to spend and defend it. In most cases, a judge will side with the individual. So non-competes might be a roadblock, but if you would ever go to court, I would guess that the judge is going to sign with the guy that doesn't have a job. Employers, do you care about your employees? When is the last time you had a, a team dinner or outing? Is it often? Do you give your employees the opportunity to be challenged? Are you allowing them to make mistakes as they are challenged? 
They need to know you have your back. Begin to trust them with the little things and grow to trust them with the more and more bigger tasks. Everyone wants to be trustworthy. When is the last time you asked your team members how they, their personal or family life was going? Team members who have family or personal just relate to them. That's the bottom line. I want to share with you a final exam my fisheries management class at the University of Wisconsin Stevens Point. Uh, it was a mock interview. I came in a suit. The guy behind me came in jeans. We both were called out for the way we were dressed. It didn't matter because it was a test, basically. Upon reflection, it was part of the interview to see how well we would hold up under fire. Uh, you know, how well we're dressed can be translated into how are you perceived by your customers and that answer is different for each customer that you have. Dress is image, accountability, professionalism, and accomplishing the job. Market research. Surveys are questionnaires. Um, there's many ways to uh, survey people about what they want or customer satisfaction. It's not often that I'll go through the grocery store, uh, Subway, I know there's a little negative with Subway, I'm getting over it. Um, uh, and uh, who is one of, we're a gas station. If you complete this survey, you're going to get something 5% off your next order or 5 bucks towards the purchase of a Big Mac or something. Just a way that you can kind of account for how well you're doing. Plan in place to promote new offerings. If you've got something new, you've got to promote it. If you don't, it's just going to stay there. Promos, promos are giveaway. I'm not talking about baseball caps. I've got, if people want baseball caps, come home with me. I've got like 350 in a box. Branding your identity. Who are you? What size, what size product do they want? What, what packaging do they want? You have to monitor the competition. Differentiate yourself from the competition without bashing them. Customer management programs, and I, I, this might be above what's going on in here, but we use Salesforce. It's just a way of us to identify everybody that's ever bought from us. We can categorize them, and we can email them. We can put them in a category of, these are the schmucks. These are the guys we've got to be really careful with. To, these are our best customers, or these are the people that buy consistently, and I want, uh, I want to engage with them. You know, market research, cost versus selling price. This is one of the more important slides that I'm putting out today. You have to understand what the cost of production is, what the selling price is, and if there's any room in there. And if it's flipped, it's like, why don't you just uh, go be the Walmart greeter? <laughs> you know, so power is a big thing in some cases. Regulations. You know, in some states, it's 30% or more of cost of production. Mortality, what does it cost to deliver the product? What are your labor costs? The cost to purchase the system. Feed is a high item. Government subsidies are not really happening in the United States. I know that we are getting help in certain university settings by getting money to them to do research to help us become better informed to make wise decisions within the industry. In the U.S., it's going in the wrong direction. It's going down. The university systems are not being supported by the federal government. And in other countries, they are. So we're at a competitive disadvantage when it comes to getting support from major universities financially. Does the market allow for your price? That's the final question. Social media. We tweet. I shouldn't. I don't tweet. I don't know how to tweet. But people in our office tweet. I don't get tweeting, but people do get tweeting. We have blogs, we have YouTube videos, we have Facebook, our website. It's more important to us internationally than it is domestically. Uh, and it is, you know, we look at the competition and they say, oh, we got to make it look better than theirs. But I wouldn't get, I think um, a, a decent website is good. You don't have to invest a ton of money into a website, in my opinion. I think that websites are not as effective as they were even five years ago. We're on LinkedIn, we do some QR codes, and I think QR codes are not really that effective anymore. I guess the moral, things, things are always changing in social media. My daughter doesn't answer her telephone, and she'll answer a text, but she's not gonna answer a telephone. If I call her, she's just gonna, ah, nah, nah, I'm not talking to him. <laughs> but she will respond to a text. <laughs> social media example. Potential whale rescue in Quebec. So, 
We saved some whales in 1998 in Barrow, Alaska. The movie The Great, The Big Miracle was uh, put out, if any of you are familiar with that movie. And we got it two years ago. Social media, uh, Facebook, a couple other things. Eight killer whales were stranded in Alaska. I was going to go board a plane to take some de-icers up there to go save the killer whales. And we got 1,500 new friends on Facebook as a result of it. I'm not sure those 1,500 friends would be friends of us in the fish farming industry, but we got 1,500 friends. And so the, what happened is that I was set to board the plane, and the tide shift, the weather shift, and the ice opened up. The whales got free, so I didn't have to go. And good thing, because it was negative 30 up there. But uh, we did get a bunch of new people on, on uh, Facebook as friends. Take advantage of free press. Press releases. Often write an article for a local newspaper or magazine. Do not turn down articles that will be written about you and your company. Uh, radio example. So talking about bullfrog fish frog farm again. I was driving from Wassa to Minneapolis, two-thirds of the way over. I hear this radio ad. It's called, eatmyfish.com. That was it. That was the ad. I think it was successful. Uh, you know, it, it certainly is unconventional, and um, it's just, it, it's, it's an alternative method. Uh, offer uh, two uh, football tickets to a local pro game with a purchase of $1,000 or more, and it works better if you say it's the Green Bay Packers, I'm pretty sure. Sell a product or service at a reduced rate that will put in a high, you can put in a high profile location, you know, like high profile location could be the governor's office or whatever. Or the, the, so we did a walk on the hill, and I, I'll get to that later uh, in, in a couple more slides. And, and so email addresses and quarterly newsletters, you know, keeping your people informed or your customers and networking with other organizations. So I speak every three, four months, partly because my sister is responsible for getting speakers for the local Optimus, and she has people back out a lot, and I'm like a stopgap, but anyway, I'm there, and I'm, I'm telling a story about Casco Marine. I, every time I sell a unit to somebody, you know, it's, oh, I've got this pond, or I've got, I want a fountain, or, and so get up in front of your friends, and they'll tell their friends. Local home shows, you know, that's, there's a possibility there. Partner with charitable causes. Google finding new customers. I challenge you to do that. Keep your website current. You know, people don't want to see stuff that was exciting in 1992, you know. Uh, farmer's market. My local farmer's market, I buy from two guys that sell fish. And I buy, if I buy from one, I'm buying from the other. I'm supporting them. And uh, they're there every week, and I'm buying from them every week that I'm there. You become a local expert, you know, radio, TV, garden writers, blah, blah, blah. Speak at Optimus, as I said before. So the National Aquaculture Association, this isn't necessarily commercial, but it is the single most powerful organization here to help you as farmers. Uh, we've done walks in Congress. We know the issues. We move the needle. And this is homework here, too www.dnaa.net, write it down. You can go there, you get a lot of information, you can, get, you can contact them, you can contact me, and with any issues that you have, if I don't know the answer, I'll find the answer. You know, the Wisconsin Coast Association, they're more, they can be more pertinent to local, regional, state issues. Uh, they're industry-led, producer-centered, promote, educate, and advocate. They organize trade shows like this or, or, or conferences like this. They can interact with the government better than we can on a national level because they understand the issue. And they network like we're doing today. Wisconsin, the number of farms is difficult to arrive at because if you stock fish, you have to have a permit. I would guess there might be 125 that make 100,000 annually or more. That's a guess. I'm not sure. Maybe someone in the audience knows the answer. The biggest hurdles are regulations and the cost of those regulations. Biggest successes, keeping farms running in spite of regulations and the downturn in the economy, diversification. So just to kind of a run through the state of different farms that I've been on. Um, this is this event, uh, Wisconsin Farm Technology Days. There's fish farmers there. We, put a, uh, we show off our aerators and fountains. And you, know, you, you need to keep kids involved. If they're not involved, it's just not going to work. 
And so that's the next generation, obviously. Scott Walker, love him or hate him, and I'm not, I'm, uh, I'm not saying either thing. I'm saying is that he was very supportive of this industry in that he um, signed a walleye initi initiative to get millions of dollars to farmers here to cooperatively raise walleye to stock in the waters of the state at a bigger size. If they stock in this way, they're getting chomped on. Stock in this way, there's a greater chance of success. And he tied it to tourism, that people are gonna spend more money in this state if they know that there's more fish to catch. I think it was a fantastic thing, and I think it's highly successful. Herbie, bullfrog, growing power, Will Allen. So some of the value of certain aquaculture systems isn't necessarily uh, measured in dollars. I mean, Will Allen's a pretty cool guy. He's, um, he's a former Milwaukee buck and that he goes after abandoned inner city buildings. He does aquaponics. He gets a lot of stuff donated. He helps troubled kids. Gets them out of crime. And so, you know, how could there be a better value than that? Is to teaching them a trait that they can use to better themselves and to clean up neighborhoods by giving them a purpose. And so how do you put a dollar value on that? You can't. I mean, it's, it's incredible. And it's working. Uh, so great story here. In a, I mean, real quickly, in the 40s, they were a mink farm. And when World War II broke out, they were feeding a little bit of the trout that they grew to the minks. Well, people weren't buying minks anymore because they didn't have money. So they switched to raising fish, and they've been doing it ever since. Great story. Tim was here yesterday. I don't see him in the crowd today. You know, stuff you can buy. Yeah, these are all from fish farms here. Uh, this is caviar, sturgeon caviar. This is all state stuff here, coming from this state. Marketing waste. You got Peter's dog food on the right. On the right, yeah, and then uh, this is um, um, fertilizer on the left. Aquaponics, Nelson and Paid, one of the national leading uh, uh, people in the state cooperatively with Chris Hartley, University of Wisconsin, Stevens Point. Superior Fresh, they've got a pretty cool story to tell. Oh, I mean, I guess I like this so much I put the slide in here twice. Yeah, this is 20 years ago. I, I, cooked some fish for Freedom High School. They had a, one of the earlier indoor intensive research systems. And so they didn't have enough fish to feed everybody, so I brought some extra stuff. We filleted up theirs and, um, and um, fed anyone that wanted to come for Harvest Day. Beaver Springs in the Dells, Star Prairie, Hunger Task Force, uh, they do some stuff with um, troubled youth as well in Milwaukee. And they have support from Harley Davidson and a few other, I think it's Briggs and Stratton, and a few other people. Uh, you know, teaching kids, including kids at risk of skill, great stuff there. Products, products, each of these places has a story. Tell your story and move the 15.5 to 20 per capita. That's it. That's all I got. Uh, other, other speakers have already covered a lot of things that we could talk about now. But I think uh, given the time, uh, we won't go over the same ground that was covered by the people from uh, uh, Urban Organics and, uh, and Superior Fresh. <clears throat> so this will be much more of a, uh, a personal account and it'll be uh, a somewhat streamlined uh, account. And then we'll have time for questions uh, afterwards. Uh, our company is, uh, the, the overall company is the Minnesota Sustainable Development Group, and uh, the, uh, the company has now created two projects in the aquaculture, aquaponics area. One of them is uh, blue water aquaculture, and the other one is the East Phillips uh, urban farm. And first I want to uh, give you just a little bit of uh, background, how, where we came from to do this. Um, uh, you know, we really started uh, a few years ago, uh, a group of us, because we were concerned uh, about um, sustainability issues. I had um, started with some of that uh, much earlier and then 
uh, we, we uh, started the, the company uh, a few years ago. But the, the one thing I wanted to emphasize as sort of a preface to the rest of this is uh, I believe that we are at a point where we are going to see some serious food security issues. I think it's just beginning, but I think it's going to become a, a, a very significant part of our future. And uh, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the work of Jim Hansen, the climatologist. And I'm assuming that most of you have heard of him. And, and uh, I, I kind of liked his uh, statement not long ago in, in reference to climate change and uh, in, in related issues. Uh, you know, all hell is about ready to break loose. And I think that's true. I think that uh, most of us uh, are not aware of how serious the, the, uh, the issues are in relation to um, planetary boundaries. Uh, and what he's talking about is that we're, we're probably going to see uh, coastal flooding. The point being, the, the issues are, are very, very uh, difficult. The um, other thing is I, I uh, looked at the uh, various ecological issues, uh, even going back to 2005 when I first started with some of this. Uh, it was apparent to me uh, right away that the main driver of these ecological issues is our current food production system. So, and this is all documented at the uh, uh, Stockholm Resilience Center website, if you want to look at the science of it. Uh, a lot of it is uh, addressed uh, with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, you know, just for the dickens of it, you know, how many of you are familiar with the Stockholm Resilience Center? Anybody? One person? I, oh, two? Great. <laughs> Oh, the Stockholm Resilience Center, and the director there is Johan Rockström. And I think everybody in our, our business needs to know about these people, because I think for, for our business to uh, get the right kind of promotion to the public at large and with government agencies and so on, I think everybody has to come to see the seriousness of the ecological issues and the importance of food system reform. And, and as I looked at, at these uh, issues and uh, the possible solutions, uh, what I came to was uh, uh, aquaculture and aquaponics. And then I took it just a step further, uh, aquaculture and aquaponics in the urban setting. And having come to that point, then I started to create the uh, Minnesota Sustainable Development Group. <clears throat> the Minnesota uh, Sustainable Development Group, um, and I'll move this forward a little bit, uh, really started uh, way back when uh, using the, the natural step program or and it's a way to form study groups and learn about the environment and about organizing the community to create more sustainable communities. I did that for a while and I formed uh, groups and I felt that you know, really isn't going to do it. So then I started to do more of the community action stuff and uh, I, uh, I organized a, a, uh, a farmer's market and I got that far. And I thought, well, the farmer's market uh, is not going to uh, reform the food system. It was a lot of fun. I also started a uh, farm, a market farm. Had a lot of fun with that. And they grew uh, products for, uh, for co-ops and for restaurants and so on. And I felt, well, it's, again, fun, uh, not much money, and not much impact. So I. Uh, uh, this, and then I, I thought, well, do one more thing here, and I started a, 
a food cooperative, and that was a little bit more impact and a little bit more money, uh, but still not what I think is needed in order to really have a reformed uh, food production, a, a fully sustainable food production system. So then I uh, moved everything up to the metro and uh, started the uh, Minnesota Sustainable Development Group and feeling that uh, to make this change is going to take a lot of talent. So I started to recruit the talent. We have a, a board of uh, five people, uh, three engineers, a CPA, and myself. And then we have uh, an advisory group of five people and uh, a couple of our venture capitalists and an attorney, an architect, and the chef. And I started to, my point was, to start to assemble all of the talent I felt would be needed to have a, a viable business uh, in, in, with a sustainable uh, food system. And then beyond uh, those uh, people, then we have a, a group of, uh, of uh, in-house consultants, and they represent another whole range of talent. Uh, marketing, three people are marketing people, and then we have a, uh, you know, uh, a couple of attorneys and, uh, and then um, um, business development people. So again, kind of building that talent framework. Uh, and then beyond the in-house consultants, there's a, a group of uh, consultants who are specialists in, uh, researchers and specialists in aquaculture and aquaponics.